Hey, what's up with it? This is Jacob Patterson. We out here. I'm here for uh, this week's podcast episode. Um, hold on, let me close iTunes because it's bouncing all around. Um, this week, if you are listening to us because you came here from No Persinium or My Haunt Life, which I would guess since those are the only two, well, I guess we just did Millennials Don't Suck, but those are the only two um, podcasts that we've been on a couple times. Um, and you already know who these two guys are. They don't really need an introduction. However, for the rest of you, um, this is going to be a different kind of podcast because uh, Mike and Russell are two very, very deeply embedded characters in the haunt scene, which is like originally haunted houses, you know, things that happen, not scary farms, that kind of stuff. Everyone has been to some kind of haunted house and these guys kind of came up through that. Well, Russell came through the theater world. Um, Mike kind of came through punk, but was just, just loved haunted houses and eventually got bored of it. And they both found their way into this new thing. I get asked a lot what, um, and in fact, we talk about this on the podcast, what kind of art is the shit that's being created now that can really hit an audience in the chest and make sure that they're going to feel something. And I believe that the art that does that the best is immersive work. And immersive now is a term that is used with the capital I. It's a buzzword to some degree. Um, go back and listen to the podcast with Noah Nelson from No Persinium that we did a couple weeks ago. And um, we go into that extensively. We don't really dive into it too far here on this podcast with, uh, with Mike and Russell. But these guys are the perfect example of once you kind of start digging a little bit into this world and when we start right out the gate talking about alternate reality gaming that's what an ARG is I don't even know if we say that in the podcast but I'm sure that uh, Madeline will list somewhere in the show notes um, what an ARG is Uh, and we just kind of hop right into it and start discussing all these different methods of that directors and producers and actors have at their disposal for how to create immersive work um, immersive theater is probably the most experimental realm in which that stuff is happening right now, but there's digital artists who are doing it. There's video artists who are doing it. There are sculptors who are doing it. It's a, it's a very transmedia friendly realm to create within. Um, that said, listening to this podcast, um, if you do know this world, then you're going to know what we're talking about as we discuss the tension experience. If you do not, I would suggest you jump to wherever it is in the show notes or just go to, I think it's thetensionexperience.com. Uh, if not, just Google the tension experience, you'll find it. Um, and kind of go back through their history and you'll get some kind of bearing of what it is we're discussing. Because Mike and Russell, and we talk about this at length on the podcast, but those two guys dove in so deep to the point where the director and the producers of the tension experience were kind of pitting them against one another and tricking them into thinking that the other person was actually a part of the production. And, you know, they've been, they've known each other for five years and have been doing these, uh, this hosting this podcast together for however long and uh, still couldn't really trust one another because of how powerful the world of immersive entertainment can be and uh, you know the tools that are at the disposal of these directors and producers, what they're capable of doing. So if you know that's not of interest to you, if you don't want to talk about a really immersive haunt experience that has an alternate reality um, gaming element, or if you don't have time to listen to like the 18 hours or whatever uh, we were joking about in terms of, which probably actually is around 18 hours of content that Mike and Russell have produced around the tension experience and talking about what it is. Whereas I listen to these podcasts and I think, um, you know, I, I'm kind of on the outside looking in, but I pick up things here and there. So out of every 10 things that are expressed, I'll understand like eight of them. So if someone's listening to music right now. I think that's uh, my cue to introduce Mike and Russell for, uh, this episode of artist real talk. Uh, if, if you're not a big part or inter, like deep inside of the immersive theater scene, I suggest you jump to like 45, 55 minutes or something like that. Um, it's a good place to kind of pick up the conversation where we start talking about a variety of different things, including things that have happened at Think Tank and just kind of talking about things in a more broad stroke as opposed to specific elements of the tension experience. 
So anyway, enjoy. Um, but yeah, so we we were trying to a couple years ago for Night on Broadway. We were going to um, yeah, it's off. Oh yeah, speaking of, it's completely off. Actually, no books. That one's over here. So <clears throat> yeah, a couple years back for Night on Broadway. This is all being cut, by the way. We were going to do a haunt type thing, like a, I mean, insofar as alone is a haunt, these like existential immersive experiences <laughs> yeah. that was going to take place in the uh, catacombs of the Tower Theater, which would have been so awesome. Have you guys been downstairs in those no. theaters? Uh, Anywhere in the back? Oh, uh, years ago, there used to be an architectural tour. They used to take you into them, so I've I've had some exposure mm-hmm. to them, but not the inner inner workings. There's there's one really really disturbing one that is now a jewelry store. Oh, really? That that you like the architectural like okay we're going to the jewelry store and you know, they just kind of waved at the manager and we just literally just walked straight through the jewelry store into their back storage area. Whoa! And the theater is still there. Really? And On Broadway, the stage, and it's. Uh, like some of the theater seats, I think, were still there, but they literally had ripped out the back of the theater seats, and it was their, the jewelry store storage area. What? And I was just like, like, what a waste! <laughs> Wait, where was this? Is on Broadway? So yeah, it was. It was like it, it was an, ar- an architectural walking tour, which I don't know even if they do anymore. Whoa! But it was about old Los Angeles, and it concentrated on the theaters, and a bunch of them are now jewelry storefronts. Whoa! That's so. crazy that there was extra theaters back there i mean that's how night on broadway started actually it was uh-huh. called day on broadway and that's what it was it was a walking tour through all the old theaters and probably places like that yeah and then the the legend goes that they went out with jwm she's like um councilman lil Weezy's best friend and uh right hand man and they went out for drinks and she was like wouldn't it be crazy if we opened up all these theaters and threw a bunch of shows at them in them at night and like shut down the street and they just did it the next year and then that's when we got involved in night on broadway how many so, years ago was that three years wow. ago well was this the third night on broadway yes this was the third night on yeah. broadway so that means four years ago was day on broadway right and three years ago night on broadway right um that was the first one our Did friend you, jake was throwing up videos from it that night and mm-hmm. it looked like it got a massive turnout oh yeah this one was pretty huge they shut down all the way from grand central market to i think a block past the ace hotel so it was gigantic did you guys go oh. i wanted to but i had the, a friend's birthday party at medieval times <laughs> that sounds <cool. laughs> how was that i've been there once I, it was my first time so it was oh, pretty really? cool <laughs> we um who did i go with we we got we just got wasted and they, we were like, like team green or whatever, you know, you like pick your team, but they, we got the whole section so into it and like against like team blue and they're like, fuck you. blue, like, they, got, <laughs> they got so into it, like almost starting fights. It was pretty great. But then there's children there too. So yeah. it's kind of like, maybe don't do that. <laughs> I wish they had adult time slots. Yeah, for real. So, uh, I don't know where this podcast will pick up and at what point we'll start, but we're started. Um, I would okay. say most people probably who are going to be listening to this know you guys better than I, cause you guys have been doing this for quite a while, but just for those who don't, um, introduce yourself so they know your voice. Age before beauty. Go for it. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Russell uh, with My Haunt Life. Hey, I'm Mike. Cool. So speaking of age before beauty, I have always wondered, how the hell did you guys meet? You guys are like, it, like you on the microphone, you are so alike. And then I'm like, where did they run into each other? Was it just the, like, was it just love at first sight? Like, did, was it in the haunt scene? Like, how'd you guys meet each other? Yeah, I mean the typical answer I give, but it's getting it's getting to be an old joke now. Is the the Craigslist um, personal <laughs> ads? But I've said that so many times. But I'm trying to think of something new to say to make and it funny. Are those but... even do those even exist anymore? Oh yeah, well, yes they do. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> that was a little fast. Um, I believe they do. <laughs> yeah, if you're ever bored and want to laugh and be, feel good about yourself, uh. look up the casual encounters section because <laughs> you will see some stuff that. 
you shouldn't be seeing. <laughs> so you mean like laugh at other people's expense, but it's anonymous other people, so you're not actually hurting anybody, so it's fine. Exactly. Cool. They don't know you're laughing. Has anyone ever utilized Craigslist as a platform for some kind of show? Mm-hmm. Actually, right now, uh, someone did. Uh, there's a, a new ARG starting oh, called sick. Black Matter Foundation, and they actually have an ad on, in the, on the Orange County Craigslist for drone pilots. Whoa. And we think it's either a Half-Life 3 ARG or a Stranger Things 2 what? ARG. Like a fan fiction kind of thing? Uh, no, oh, no. Like official branded. Like official. Whoa. Yeah. And there's a website and everything. And like it's there. You sign up and they send you, uh, they sent uh, people that, that emailed them or, or sent a questionnaire through the website, a WAV file that was Morse code. And the what? Morse code was the password to get to a certain part of the website what? to fill out an application form. And yeah, oh my God. it just literally let this past week started. Oh my God. Okay. So let's hop right into this. Cause ARG, it's something that we <laughs> talked about. I've t- we talked about it a couple of times on this podcast. ARG is something I'm super into when I was, I think the first time I ran to an ARG was like, it might've been when Halo four came out or something like that, or the matrix video game. Um, I remember I was, it, it, they called it transmedia. But there was an actual ARG element, I believe, to the to the Matrix video game when the second and third movies were coming out. And that was pretty much it. I didn't realize you could, you know, do what people are doing with it now. You talk about the tension experience. So how like how do you guys find this shit? Like how did how did you find this one, for example? Actually a couple people just randomly hit me up. Hmm. Um it, it's one of those things where when one person finds it, it's like, okay, who is gonna like this and who's gonna possibly know what this is more so than me? Okay, hmm. I'm gonna email this person, I'm gonna email this person. Have you guys heard of it? And then it just starts spreading that way. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. So it's kind of like the nature of an ARG is that it has to be solved by like a collective mind kind of, because people have to share clues with one another. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And do you, have you, are you into this one, Russ? Uh, no, not this one that Mike is mentioning. Uh, I am fairly new to the whole ARG thing. The first, the first time I was ever aware that such a thing existed was the Cloverfield film. Oh yeah. And people I, talk about that one, yeah. yeah, at that time I was finding some of the advertisements, you know, for the soft drink and the movie and all that stuff. But I didn't really pursue it. I didn't really get into it. Hmm. Uh, and when the tension experience started, that was the first time I'd ever bought into an ARG. Hmm. And I bought in fully yeah. once I started kind of getting the hang of it. But I, I leaned on Mike because I, I, I kept asking, like, I don't know how I'm supposed to behave. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to be. Like, how, like, am I supposed to be pursuing something? Am I supposed to be looking for other things? And <laughs> and he just got like, okay, solve this puzzle. Solve this. And he was pointing me toward what I was finding. Yeah. And and then occasionally he would go look deeper there. or like So he was sort of a coach, hmm. you know, as, as well as my friend offering advice on it because I really didn't know what to do. Hmm. And I thought there were more rules about them. Hmm. I, I, th- I think my problem was I was trying to do it the right way, yeah. whatever that would have been. So in other words, you were overthinking. Yeah, which, which I do. That's, that's my thing. It's well, what I, I do. Think also, especially you're talking about the tension experience, right? Yeah. I, and listening to Darren, it sounds like he wanted people to kind of break it because they were writing it as they went. Right. So he was like, yeah, we thought we had, you know, the entire thing or like half of it done before mm. we launched the whole thing. And then they were, ran out of content like a day or two or however long it was when I've, when I've listened to him tell stories about how the tension experience started. And <clears throat> are you... Um, Mike, are you like super experienced in ARGs or like when was the first one you ran into? Uh, the first main, main one I did was, uh, was probably the dark Knight. Um, mm. I had toyed around with Cloverfield, um, mm. but there was so much. And with the job I had at that point, it was, there was so much going on. So it was like, Oh, I found a hidden video or, you know, I found this person is a employee of this company and huh. Oh my God, that's cool. But when the dark Knight happened, Batman's my favorite thing. I collect Joker mm. memorabilia. I collect Harley Quinn. So Joker and Harley Quinn, and it's like, oh my god, the second film is going to have the Joker because at <laughs> the end of Batman Begins, they tease with the Joker card, and yeah. and so when they started that, I was at Comic Con, so I got to see everybody with their face painted. I you cool. know, and it started then, and I was just in. And yeah. luckily, I was at a job in L.A. And a lot of the LA experiences happened down the street from where I was working, so I was able to go and participate. And there was one um, uh, where you had to go to a bowling alley, find a key, and inside the bowling alley was a a, a locker, and Whoa. you unlock it, and you there was a bowling ball 
You know, Whoa. there was another one where you had to solve a riddle and it led you to a cake a cake shop. And this is all over the country, not just LA. And when you go to the cake shop, you have to say, I'm picking up for Robin Banks. Robin Banks, get it? <laughs> Robbing a bank, because uh, that's what Joker does. And inside the cake was a cell phone. Whoa. And the people that got the cell phone got text messages and phone calls and stuff like that. And I actually, they actually did a, um, a, a branded thing with Domino's and I won that one. So what? I'm super stoked. Yeah. So they had a thing and the first person to get to Domino's got a pizza and they got the citizens of Batman mask what? and it's like a Batman mask and it has a stamp on it. And I won that. So I still have that. Holy and, crap. Did yeah. you have to pay money for this? No, all of it was free. I mean, it's a marketing budget for, you know, one of the biggest, grossest yeah. movie, movies of all time. So yeah. I think so they, they had were like ready. a limited number. Like if you, if you were on top of it early enough, then you'd be fine. Exactly. <laughs> but those who were late to the game didn't get in. Right. Damn, that's cool. And then, but I would, those things, I mean, when you're talking about a giant um, brand like that, like DC Comics is putting on something of that magnitude and plus whatever like studio that they're working with to put out the film, um, it doesn't sound like they'd be able to have the versatility needed to kind of like revamp it once when you're like, you're telling Russ like, Oh, are you overthinking it? Like you don't have to play exactly by the rules, but probably for the Batman one you did, because if you right. find some way to break it, they're not going to re they're not going to write a new line of like a new line in the script on the spot and start a new story arc right then and there. Right. And they, they had hired a specific company to do it. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like, you know, the owners of DC were doing it themselves yeah. where things could get broken. You know, when you hire someone and they have a staff, like with that's their main job, it's going to be hard to break something like that. Yeah, that's true. Because jobs are on the line at that point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah so very I, true. I think it partially, like, I think more eyes would have been on that than something like the tension experience when it began. Yeah. Because you've got so many Dark Knight fans and so many people that are, are looking for something like that. Yeah. So I think it partially depends on the individual project and how many eyes might be on it at the beginning. Yeah. And we, so we talked about the tension experience on the podcast with uh, Noah. So if anyone's listening and hasn't heard of what the tension experience was, I strongly suggest you go back and just listen to that one portion. Just look at the show notes. You'll find when we talk about it with Noah because he breaks it down in like 15 minutes what it actually is. <laughs> I have a feeling we're going to go a little bit deeper with you guys because you guys are very deep. And, and by the way... <laughs> Thank you, and I'm sorry for <laughs> the 18 hours <laughs> that you listened to. <laughs> Wait, how many hours was it? How, how much, how much um, content did you actually make about the Yeah, you mean experience? for My Haunt Life? Yeah. Uh, I, I think I've never figured it out. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know it was... It was probably close to that, actually. I mean, you guys did a couple, like, dedicated, like, two or three hour podcasts that were just about the tension yeah. experience, right? And yes, the, the final did. one was four hours. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was pretty nuts. So how did, like, how'd you find it? How'd you get... So like Russ was saying, you, you just bought in like hook, line and sinker. How'd you, or how'd it find you? Oh, do we need to go for it? Uh, cause I, it's so cool. Cause I like, you know, people always say like, where were you when I you actually, know, the president was shot or like, it's like, where were you when you found out about the tension experience? And this is ingrained in my mind <laughs> because I, I was, I had spent some time over at Mike's place mm. and we were talking about haunts in general, we were talking about new trends, we were talking about things that were working and weren't working for us. Oh, wow. And uh, I don't remember at the time what it was that wasn't working for us. <laughs> <laughs> but we but we had had a couple of bad experiences with customer service. Hmm. We'd had a couple of things where haunts tried to do puzzles and do mystery things that just hmm. were more annoying than successful. Yeah. And we were talking about there were a couple of uh, haunts that were really taking the attitude of, you know, like kind of like a superior. I don't know. Like, like haunt elitist. Ha yeah, to some degree. <laughs> like and we putting were, to the back of the room, but and, in a haunt sense. And, and we, we were just talking about like, is this a shift in the industry? Is this because we're detecting this with a couple of shows in a row with a couple of different people? And it was it was frustrating because we are so excited to be patrons of the haunt scene. Yep. And I got a text in the middle of that conversation. Hey, speaking of a text in the middle of the conversation. Yeah. Welcome, Dino. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I think you guys already know Dino. He's going to It's our here. trap house host. <laughs> Hello. Actually, yeah, that is that is what he was doing back then. Um, so you're having this conversation, and then uh, somewhere in the middle of it, uh, you got a text? I got a text, and it was a, a friend of mine who said, 
dude, like, I know you're going to be so into this, but I don't know how much I should tell you. <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm and sure he, you guys get texts like that all the time, actually. And he said, okay, there's something which I think you're going to be into, hmm. and but I think I should just let it sit, and you're going to have to find it. And Mike what? and I had been... How does that even work? Uh, <laughs> exactly. Well, that, and Mike and I had been sitting about the frustration of, it's like, we're here. Our wallets are open. We want to support you. And then somebody sends me this text of, there's this really cool thing that you're going to be so into, but it's Whoa. hidden from you and you have to work your and butt off for Russell it. Russell doesn't really get pissed a lot, but when that text came, <laughs> you, he turned into Hulk Russell. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see Hulk Russell. Because <laughs> we had literally spent an hour and a half talking about, like, this is the sort of thing that turns us off. Hmm. Like, because we're so willing to participate hmm. and then if you but if you make it too difficult if yeah. you make it too elusive uh, i have a life and a job <laughs> that i also have to dedicate many hours of my life to yeah so it was just very funny that i got that text yeah. and i and i replied back and i was just like okay <laughs> but to be totally honest not feeling it right at this moment. <laughs> you know, and the person responded like, uh, everything okay? And I said, you just told me I'm going to have to work my butt off or something and you're not willing to even tell me what it is. It's like, <laughs> no, not doing okay in this moment. Did they even give you a hint? Uh, they eventually said, trust me and look at over here. And they gave me the first clue that I eventually find the, found the Tension oh, Experience wow. website. And so they gave me a clue. So this person was there. a friend of yours? Yeah. Was it a plant? I don't. Think I love you could call like the look on your face right now when people when people go back and listen. If they do, go back and listen to all of the tension experience podcasts you guys made and how confused you both are through the whole process. Like at some point, you start thinking each other is a plant to some degree, which is pretty fucking awesome. You're like, could it be? Like, oh, I, yeah. I don't think you really thought it, but you're like, eh, maybe. And the look on Russell's face, and I was like, was it a plant? He just looked up in the air, like, wait a second. <laughs> Uh, I I think that person may have been instructed to give me the uh, push. Okay, so kind of. Yeah, kind of is the answer. Yeah. Also, I when I think of Hulk Russell, I just think of a Ron English painting. Do you guys know Ron English, the artist? <laughs> There's a particular painting. I'll give it to, to Madeline so she can put it in the show notes, and uh, you can tell me if you think of it, if you think there's any resemblance. Um, so, so there's so many th Russells, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so then what? Then. What was the first clue? Uh, uh, basically, uh, did he point me to the Facebook page? No, I thought he gave you the website because you, I remember you guys were arguing through text and it was like, because I remember you yelling at me saying like, why does he just give me the effing website? <laughs> and then maybe, he that, maybe, maybe he did like push it. Maybe he just gave me like, like start here. And then that led to the first puzzle, yeah. which you had to solve, which led to mm -hmm. a telephone number, which led to something hidden in the website, uh. which... Um, yeah, and that, that was my beginning of it. Got it. And so, and that was how you began as well, right? Well, yeah, we were there. Yeah. <laughs> you're Together. Center. So I was just wondering were you if you recording got... that conversation where, where you were like, oh my God, the fucking haunt world, like. No, 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 no that, we was had, just, that was just us hanging out. We were just out. hanging out. Yeah. Right. Like we had gone to like dinner or something and, you know, we randomly got the heat. Russell randomly got that text and I was like, oh, well, let's check this out. And. So we looked at it, it as like, okay, creepy music. That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, weird visuals. That's cool. Oh, we messed up. Oh, there's a Charles Manson quote. Okay, that's cool. I yeah, like where this is going. There was a going. Poe quote, which immediately won me over. Yeah, Alistair Crawley quotes. Like, okay, where's, where's this going? And then finally we figured out, it's like, oh, okay, if you do this, this, and this, you can enter your email. So then we mm -hmm. entered our email and then waited for the next thing to happen. And wow. then I texted the guy and went, okay, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> With that tone in your text message. Yes. Um, how, how did they start, like, how did that person find it? Or, like, how did they start advertising it? Like, how, how did Darren first get it out there or whoever was helping him get it out there? Do you know? Do you, does anyone even know that? I mean, well, the, the person that got the information to Russell has worked with Darren uh, in the past oh, yeah. cool. on, on movies and, and stuff cool. like that. So... I believe I want to say he was probably helping or testing at some point. Yeah. Um. To what this big next thing is going to be, and then they, you know, we we don't know for sure, but it's probably something like okay, spread the word to people that you will be into this. Right. Yeah, I see. Cool. And what did Darren? Darren, that was his first 
entry into the immersive world at all, right? Well, I know he's a huge fan. Yeah, it's his first entry of something that he did on on his own. His first production. Yeah. Cool. And what do you guys think? Was it like a really crazy fresh perspective, like welcome with open arms, or was it like, oh, this guy really knew what he was doing, like he really did his homework first? Or was it how? Where did it fall on the scale of like? You're talking about the haunt world being kind of insular at this point where you're playing to the back of the room versus like completely fresh perspective that could invite in a brand new audience. Like, was it both? It depends on when you ask, because if you asked us during it, there was a lot of frustration from a lot of people because it's like, well, wait a minute, we did this, but they're saying this. And we were actually just talking about that today. Um, But if you ask today, as of right this moment, to me, it's one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me. Wow. Yeah. Cool. And would you say one of the greatest things that's happened to the haunt world as well? I I think the tension experience is one of the most important things that's ever happened to LA. Wow. Holy crap. (laughs) Because seriously. (laughs) I'm saying holy crap because I have been saying that for months on the My Haunt Life podcast. Huh. So, and it's, I think it's, it's one of the first times that I've ever heard him start with that quote. <laughs> you yeah, got I mean, a new podcast I, yeah. now, homie. <laughs> I mean, I, I told that oh, to, to Darren I'm and Clint. Clint. Mike. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like, I, I completely am in agreement with Mike. I, and I have a very different perspective because he, he is experienced with ARG stuff. Huh. I came into this as a newbie to the ARG concept. Cool. I, and so I was confused by a lot of it. I was frustrated by much of it. I was moved emotionally by big chunks of it. Yeah. And uh, we covered all of that from both of our perspectives on the podcast yep. repeatedly. And then we kept finding that other people were re- reaching out to us going, we're responding the same way. Hmm. It's like, and, but that was the thing that I kept saying, even when I think they fumbled sometimes and they lost some people along the way, it was like, I'm out. It's like, yeah. you know, whatever. I, the thing that struck me is, I don't know what this is, but this is so freaking ambitious. Yep. And because I was familiar with the shows in New York that are immersive, you know, I am familiar with Third Rail. I am familiar with, the, you know, the big companies that have been doing immersive stuff for a while. Mm-hmm. So I realized that this was something different, that this was a new tone, that this was playing on multiple playing fields. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, their live events had, you know, especially in, in one situation with me, they did a little, like a, a haunt moment with me that was very specific tailored to me in one of the events. Hmm. And they were really like pushing my button. Hmm. I was like, okay, we, oh, they're so they're personalizing this and yet they're giving everyone almost the same experience. And then like, like whoever is doing this is so ambitious and they are reaching for the stars. Hmm. And I think Mike is right. Yeah. That's the importance of this yeah. is the fact that they were so ambitious trying to cover so much ground in so many different formats simultaneously yeah. that See, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to, that's not even what I mean by saying that they're the most important thing that's happened. Like, oh, okay. Well, so on top of all that, on top of all that, they, you know, one of the things they always stress about is community. They brought a community of people that are so different Mm. together and unified Mm -hmm. all of these people there are people that have never heard of immersive theater before that are now that did tension they're now doing the speakeasy society they're doing shine on collectors they're doing any lesser stuff there's people from the theater world that have never done haunts before it's like oh this is cool i like this is what's what's like this but scary you know so so that people are doing creep they're doing alone all Mm. because of the tension experience brought it together yeah so i mean i think a lot of companies have tension to thank for bringing so many new customers indirectly yeah. just because all these people are getting together. It's like, Oh yeah, you like this? Have you checked out this company? Have you checked out this show? Have you checked out this haunt? Yeah. And all these people are so hyped on what tension was. They just want everything now. Like yeah. they just, it's like hungry, hungry hippos and the marbles <laughs> are experiences. Ooh, I like that. Also, Madeline's yeah. going to have a good time looking up all the different shows. <laughs> <laughs> We put all. Did you just find half of them, Dino? No, uh, that would be crazy if my um, fingers can move that fast. Like, and by the way, all of like a bunch of the shows that he listed are are literally like running this weekend and next oh, weekend cool. and next month and yeah. like yeah, a so bunch of Noah's newsletter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Plug. Uh, we should definitely get those in there. I was gonna ask a question. Uh, how often do you find that when you start something so ambitious, that it's a process of people? 
wanting to be a part of it and then falling off? Or is it more of like there is a core group of people and they just go for it? Because you mentioned like at one point that this someone was on board and then they fell off. How often does that happen? Is, is it like pretty regular or is it more like a, like a very solid effort moving forward? I think every show is going to have that because you're not going to make everybody happy. Mm-hmm. And some shows are going to do something that you may not agree with. And at some point it may cross a personal line for you. So it's like, okay, I'm out. You know, there's... That- that personal line though, like, is there a pattern? Is, is there a, especially with this thing, immersive theater and this, uh, this whole, you know, escape room, uh, movement, is there a, like, very known personal line or does it move from show to show? Yeah, I think it, it depends on the person. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, cause I don't, you know, if, if we were running a show, we don't know your history for the most part, mm-hmm. you know, like if we, if we do something like, you know, if we make a joke about murder, you know, maybe you had a sister that was murdered and that's a trigger for you. So it's like, you know what, you joke about this, I'm done. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's definitely true. <clears throat> and did you find that, um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, uh, so for people who just went to the haunt portion of that show like noah's i keep bringing him up but just because as far as our he's audience a sexy goes, beast <laughs> yeah <he's a> sexy <laughs> beast. And as far as our audience goes like that's the introduction to the immersive world and a lot of people i think and we should keep this in mind a lot of people are probably going to find the immersive world from i've had people find what immersive is immersive with a capital i through this podcast and ask me questions about it and i just send them shit like that mm-hmm. um who was that person who just did the immersive performance um workshop that uh, Noah was talking about. Oh, it hasn't happened yet. Four Larks. Oh, it's the one coming from New York. uh, It's at the end of March at basic flowers. Yeah. 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 This, well, here's an advertisement for that. Everyone should fucking go to it. Cause I had a bunch of people say like, (laughs) Hey, what's the, like, I'm trying to do something to really like flip the art world upside down. It's just for the record. He has announced that it is sold out. Oh, it is sold out. Uh, Yeah. Okay. Well, Let's then, kill. I think it sold out very quickly. <laughs> well, then this is good press for the next one. <laughs> but I said, maybe I helped. Maybe my friend Kai actually bought one. But she was asking me on New Year's Eve, we were talking, and she was like, yeah, I'm just really trying to figure out something like, how can I make something just that really impacts audiences and just really hits them in, uh, in the chest? And, you know, all this stuff is so easy to ignore. And I was like, immersive art, man, immersive theater, immersive art. Like, you can do immersive installation for sure, and people can have an actual experience, but it has to be something where you have to be there. And this immersive theater shit, it doesn't exist if you're not there. If the audience doesn't sacrifice themselves to that immersion, then the show doesn't exist. Oftentimes, you play a role in the show that if the role doesn't exist, then the story can't happen. And so I tell people that a lot um when they're asking me like what's the ne- you know the next big thing in art the next like really cool experience experience that we can give to our viewers i tell them immersive is a big place so this is a it's a good thing to keep in mind because we're gonna have to name drop a bunch of places they can look by the end of this podcast um <laughs> also that- you mentioned art mm-hmm. it's like immersive art installations have been around for years in a yep. different format and like mm-hmm. I, I i'm sure you're probably familiar with the work of karen finley mm-hmm. you, yeah, yeah you know years ago she did an immersive art piece yeah. at the modern art where like there were actors there were like yeah. like her 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 installation involved actual human beings yeah. being part of the art and you came in and you were weaving tapestries with the character like, and you were doing all of this interactive stuff that was an immersive piece yeah and it was deeply emotional yeah very disturbing and very sad and you know like taking the fly i don't know if you remember the piece i'm talking about if, if i don't know you, that one particularly we'll, um, we'll link it link it in the show notes we'll um, it up. it's it's been years mm-hmm. ago but i i to this day remember that piece because of the immersive element of it mm-hmm. and the fact that you know i was given you know a rose and what was i to do with the rose and i chose to weave it into the tapestry at the end of the show and cool. you know there were they were uh it, that was kind of renowned for the fact that they actually had people living and sleeping like in, in a bed hmm. during the art installation and so they were there all the time you can come in and watch someone actually a live human being sleep for part of the show and that was think tank's art installation too for seven years you could have charged <laughs> yeah, missed opportunity and now we're having people uh actively moving out because of uh 
certain terms and conditions yeah, in the middle of this podcast. That's what you're hearing in the back when you hear yeah. wheels go by. There, um, there was actually a point where we were about to do a reality TV show about yeah, us yeah. being here. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We did for a little while. Maybe we can find that somewhere and share it. But that, no, it's it's so funny though because when we did Alone, do you guys did, did Alone here? Mm-hmm. The time that we had it here? Yeah, the, yeah, that was our second year, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd love to hear more about it, but um, there was a portion, I, I might have already shared this with you guys or on this podcast, but there was a, a portion where we had to have everyone lock their doors so that no one could go into them because you had to go actually through the living space in the back that we had told that we had worked into the set as part of the set for a haunt. So that's how we were able to like permit the whole thing and make it run and 100% legally. It did. We did actually run it that way, which was pretty awesome and clever on our part, I might say. Actually, clever on uh, Larry and Devin's part because they were the <laughs> two that pulled it off. But one person forgot to close their door and uh, someone was walking by and they were like, open the door and there's a guy with his shirt off eating ramen, like sitting in what looked like a room. <laughs> and he just kind of waved at me and I was like, okay, and just felt uncomfortable and closed the door and kept going because I was like, not that room. And then continued down because you're kind of supposed to explore back there. So maybe we should have. We should have been like, it was a Karen Finley style installation. I got this one special. Did you get the ramen scene? <laughs> I'm the only person who got it. Yeah. What track were you on? Someone wrote about it in Yeah. That's how they basically wrote about it. Like, yeah. It was so authentic. It was, yeah. uh, felt like I was in someone's life. Yeah, I think it was a, I think it was a Yelp review, that one, yeah. which was, yeah, it was pretty awesome but so how i mean what do you guys think that experience was like dino was asking how, what do you think that experience was for people who only did the haunt portion like only did the live production experience and not all the rest of tension was it as powerful or or, or probably not uh it depends on how much you wanted to put into it uh mm-hmm. it could, because you could go to that without any prior knowledge and it, the show as a whole would make sense to you mm-hmm. and i've actually become friends with quite a few people that didn't partake in the arg but went through tension loved it and went through a second time mm-hmm. even went through a third time really yeah and without doing any of the arg just because the story and the performances it, it was just so impactful why do you think noah didn't enjoy it so much then did you guys talk about this on your podcast with him? Um, a little bit, but not not too much in depth. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think yeah. you'd have to be more specific with him. Yeah. So I, it hits everyone differently. Yeah. I think part of the brilliance of what Tension did is the fact that they did make that night. You know, if you hadn't played the ARG aspect of it, if you hadn't in, in gotten involved with those characters, they set it up at the beginning. Of you know, you're going to this place you know that there's this organization you know that there's something up and they have a purpose and then when you walk in the door it's like okay they're either indoctrinating me for something Hmm. or they're interviewing me for something or they're trying to convince me of something Hmm. So it gave an extra le- level of mystery almost. So, yeah. yeah. And you so, perceived as just like more fun. And yeah. then and once you bought your ticket, you would get a- an email with, with basically the backstory. And yeah. you would get Addison's father emailing you like, look for this girl. It's Addison. She's mm-hmm. going to, you know. And, and then as soon as you walk in, you know who that is. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually what I was going to ask. So you said that they customized the actual haunt experience for you, but that was for you guys. Like you guys were balls deep in the tension experience. So it was a lot <laughs> easier for them to do so because they were almost playing you two like fiddles to some degree. Um, I think you know, they did a couple willful, of times. Willfully so on your end, but, or maybe not in a couple of different ways. Who knows? Oh, one thing <laughs> in your, in your podcast, uh, uh-huh. with, when, in your interview with Noah uh-huh. and you were talking about Russell and the flower and how you guys thought that was the character. Mm. Oh, wait, you also said that you didn't want to know if it was the character or if it was him. No, he, Noah said that. I'm okay. cool. You can break. I'll tell Noah not to listen to this one. Okay. So that's, spill the beans. That's Russell. Really? That's Russell in his heart. Huh. Like, seriously. Wow. And it just hit you that hard? You were like, you just fell into it that deep? There was one specific thing that got me, and that was um, meeting the character of Addison. Mm. Because I... I I was lucky enough to get a sequence that I don't know how many people got that sequence. And it's very funny because I drove by the hotel yesterday where this happened. Like they, Mm -hmm. I I sort of got this weird, I was supposed to, I was set up for, to go have a meeting with this character and I sort of got kidnapped (laughs) with several other people. And they gave us, I met this set of parents who told me this story about, their daughter who had lost her way and they were looking for her and they were very concerned about her safety. And then the tension experience emailed everyone 
who had been involved in that situation well, and said, we need information from you. What happened? Why didn't you come to our meeting? Why did you decide to go over there? And mm -hmm. I was like, and I wrote back completely in character, which this is part of the ARG thing, which Mike had, had, had been helpful enough that at this point I was on my own. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I'm going to play this for all yeah. it's worth. And I wrote back to them and I said, I am so sorry. You know that I am dedicated. Like, you know that well, I wanted to attend that meeting. This was, you have to understand this was not my choice that I was like, I was not given an option. It's like, this is this, you know, mm -hmm. choice was taken away from me. This is what it was. And look, I have serious questions for you because I have serious doubts now because of information I was told today. Mm -hmm. I just played it all in character. And so suddenly I get an invitation to another event. Well, hold on back up. So there, this is, the tension weekender like that I call it because <laughs> there was an event on Saturday and then there was an event on Sunday. And on that Sunday was a donut mixer for, for the majority of people that were playing along. Whoa. Russell didn't get an invite to a that. Donut mixer. Yeah. yeah. I was about to say, like, that <laughs> <laughs> that's dope that's good branding right there what's a donut mixer just like a cocktail mixer yeah it was with donuts coffee tea it donuts was, yeah it was an in-person cool. event where we actually first met addison and uh, some other characters and um yeah it was just juice and water wait and, so is this like i'm sorry to interrupt you but yeah. is this like their production team was like okay we have these people and we think we have them hooked enough that mm -hmm. we can use them as part of what we're doing and then because it was a responsive piece, which in a weird way, it wasn't just site responsive, which it definitely was, but it was almost like guest responsive as well, mm -hmm. where you guys were helping to shape the story as they were writing it. And they realized you were part of this small group of people that they could indoctrinate mm -hmm. and then tie into that story. Yeah. So that was, that was the third event. Uh, that weekend was the, the, the third and fourth event technically. Um, and by that point, there was a core group of people like really into it. How and many people those, do you think was at that event? Like, uh, maybe 20. Yeah. Was Juliet yeah. Bennett, Julie Bennett Riley there? No. Riley, how do you say her name? She has a complicated name. Bennett Ryla. I believe. J J <laughs> JBR. Yeah, JBR <laughs> um, but so with that mixer, Russell didn't get invited and he got invited to the event on Saturday, which he just described. So because he emailed them back, and he was just saying he got another invite. He's the only person that got an invite to go back mm -hmm. on that Sunday. So he's the only person that did both of those events. Like wow. that's an important thing to mention, I think. And I think the whole reason I did is because I was the one person of the people who got those emails. I was the one who responded full out. Like mm -hmm. I, this is me responding honestly, responding, you know, as Russell would respond to the situation. It's like, I don't want to offend anyone. And yet like I wasn't given the opportunity to go to the meeting I was supposed to go to, which I had agreed to go to. And, mm. you know, I got a phone call in the middle of this event going, and can we cuss? Yeah, like, absolutely. Like literally it was like, what the fuck are you doing? Why the <laughs> fuck didn't you show up where you were supposed to be? Where the fuck are you? Like, Whoa. like they, they gave me this phone call in the middle, like, and I turned around to everyone else. I'm like, guys, we're in the wrong vehicle, <laughs> you know? Whoa. And I, were you though? Or were they playing that? I know. They're like, they, it, was, it was all orchestrated by the tension experience, cool. but like that's how they played it is like that we were picked up by someone else. Oh, cool. That they sent a car for us and the car couldn't find us. And another person kind of absconded with us. But because I responded, honestly, I think that's what Mike was referring to. Like that's mm. my character. Yeah. And the next day was when I met the character of Addison. So I had the double hit of meeting this girl's parents mm. who told me this story of the, whoops, I just hit the microphone. Sorry. Okay. Uh, hitting, yeah, the the getting the story Wait, of hold on can i do something yes parents oh, in air please. quotes <laughs> <laughs> in air quotes um so i had gotten the story of the long lost daughter and then i walk into the event the next day mm. to find this young girl mm. a young woman who seems terrified and lost and so it just like, oh my God they have created an entire family structure they have created this entire plot and i have seen both sides of it and so that's what won me over personally yeah so looking back and you know hindsight's 2020 what do you what do you think would have happened if you had just after maybe the first or second interaction where you're like okay they're working what i do into the narrative of this show for everybody not just for myself but like to some degree this show is changing in a weird way like you got to go to these two events no one else did and that certainly affected the way that they were playing it out um 
and you had the whole thing with the rose and like all, all that stuff. What do you think would have happened if you had just changed outright, started responding to every different situation in the exact opposite way? <laughs> Thank you, Dino. <laughs> I'm looking at the waveforms. You know, waveforms are a little bit smaller than everyone else's. Got it. No. Um, He's concerned about the size of your waveforms. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for giving me a There's hand a little... there, Dino. <laughs> It's like technical adjustment being done behind the scenes here. Uh, <laughs> so if you had just res- just stopped, like dead in your tracks, and like I'm going to flip this completely, you know, head over heels and just respond in the exact opposite way and just start being a dick to everybody, or, or you know, just ch- change your character outright. Well, it's interesting because when what do you think uh, they would have done for my haunt life? We had a chance to interview Darren and Clint. Clint Sears, the writer, and Darren Bassman, the director, yeah. and creator, and so. And we actually talked a little bit about that because I asked if they intended for me to react to that first meeting. Mm. And I said, were you expecting me to go, well, screw the main organization. Obviously, they're the bad guys. I'm going to go with this offshoot group Mm. because I could have done that. And they said, no, we didn't expect anything specific. But if you had done that your storyline would have changed. The characters would have reacted to you differently. You probably wouldn't have encountered Addison the way you did. Like, so Hmm. I I just think it would have been a different storyline for me and what I was observing. Yeah. But it wasn't pre-written. No, it was not. That's yeah. Yeah. And so they probably, they would have, they would have changed the way that they were writing things as they went. I, I just wonder how much of it was, I guess it's like writing a, tv series like halfway through you start to you're like let's kill that person off and see you know when it when it doesn't come from another source you can do that um i think of like the sopranos for example uh but yeah it's just it's so for people who have like myself who didn't have the opportunity to enjoy the tension experience because we were throwing our own haunt or just didn't know what (laughs) this shit was um if you had to suggest to them okay you know, they're doing the, what's the next one called lust, mm-hmm. the lust experience. And have they already started any of the ARG portion for that? Or are no. they doing an ARG portion? We, we don't know. We hope so. Uh, on their Facebook about what, where we're recording. Can I say the date? Does it matter? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, so sure. we're recording this the night of uh, February 12th, mm-hmm. uh, on Facebook about 27 days ago, they put a 29. So if you oh, count cool. down, it would have been like either like tomorrow or Valentine's Day, depending on, you know, Valentine's when Day, you do it. So, right. but that's since been removed. Oh, so wow. we don't know if anything is going to happen for Lust starting huh. uh, on Valentine's Day. But cool. However, know. someone did notify us a few hours ago that apparently the Lust Experience website is not available at this particular moment. Whoa. I wonder if that's all playing into it. or I mean, I'm sure it is because it, now they have to respond to the fact that that stuff is happening and yeah. you guys are talking about it, which mm-hmm. have already been responsive to the past. <laughs> So um, we have a feeling they're probably updating the website in some manner. Yeah, probably. probably. Huh, that's interesting. And actually what's funny is this episode is going to come out the night of Valentine's Day. Oh. We're going to put it out. I mean, it comes out Wednesday morning, so like overnight on Valentine's Day. So when people listen to it, they can go there. So all the romantic the... people on Valentine's Day <laughs> getting together or and listening to your podcast. The <laughs> Lust Experience. <laughs> is it the lustexperience.com? Yes, it is. Yes. With a T-H-E in front? Mm-hmm. Hmm. So for people who are, a lot of people, I'm sure this will be their first foray into this world at all. And this is like the deepest you can go into it, it sounds like, in L.A. Um, where would you suggest someone start with that? Like the tension experience has a portion on the website that kind of has the history Mm -hmm. and how it kind of breaks down. Um, But, and then you guys did a pretty extensive job covering it on your podcast, but where would you suggest people start if they're like, I want to get into this and this, this seems like the best way to, to drop in. Um, Well, it depends. Do you mean the tension experience? Do you mean immersive theater? Do you mean haunts? Let's say they start just jumping right into Darren stuff and Clint stuff with the uh, tension, lust, experience, mm-hmm. yada, yada. Um, I guess just I would say go to the website and um, the lust experience. And then because we don't know what's going to be there, be on there yet. Um, so maybe go to the forums on the tension experience website mm-hmm. um, a- as far as that stuff. You know, follow all the social media, Facebook, yeah. that kind of stuff. And, and you know, ask questions. And mm-hmm. submit your email because they have been – like there, there was a place up until the website went dark for a little while. Um, there, there was a place where you could just submit your email. And then if you submitted your email, you get this message like, we'll be in touch soon. Oh, cool. Is it possible to get caught up? 
It's or all, did they miss it? For less experience, nothing has happened yet. Well, yeah. for but it's going to exist within the same canon from what everyone's hope is. Nah, well, what we understand is that it's going to be more of an American horror story type of thing. So mm. you'll see the same people, but they're not going to be the same characters. Mm. So even though it, there's going to be some relation, it's not... I believe you can go into lust without knowing anything about tension. Cool. But there'll be Easter eggs. And, yeah, and probably. Like possibly, yeah. And what about for people who are like, God damn it, I missed it. I'm just talking for myself here. I don't know if anyone <laughs> listening you know, relates to what I'm saying, but I'm like, God fucking damn it, I missed it. I missed the tension experience. Is there a way to get caught up on what happened there? Or did I just miss it? There was some like Periscope shit, wasn't there? And you can still oh, probably watch a, that somewhere. Yeah, there's there are definitely Periscopes. Um, some of them have been removed, um, but... Uh, I think some of them are still there. It depends on what the settings are on mm. their account. Um, but there's that, and there's a timeline yeah. on the forums. Mm -hmm. You know, they do offer sort of like a catch-up timeline on the yeah. forums. Cool. So that would be the best way to do it, probably. Yeah. So probably just like spark a joint, lay down <laughs> your computer, <laughs> open the history <laughs> portion, and just dive into the rabbit hole. And then for the next three days, listen to the Might Haunt Life podcast. Yeah. You remember which, which episodes those were? And that's, and that's one of the things too, is, you know, we, we, we wanted to take, we wanted to uh, uh, tongue tied. <laughs> like at one point we realized how important this was becoming. Mm -hmm. So it became like also a documentation, yeah. you know, we wanted to catch people up um about like everything that happened because we had we had people contact us be like you know thank you so much because my yeah. schedule i can't mm -hmm. i don't know anything i can't i can't dive into it so it was a good we tried to have a good summary but then looking back it was like oh my god this is a documentation of things like i'll go back and listen to it it's like oh my god i can't i forgot totally forgot that mm -hmm. happened yeah that's thing. happened to me several times because I, I sometimes because i'm the one who edits the podcast i've had to go back and okay, well, wait, can I pull that audio? Can I look? Can I look for mm -hmm. something? I want to clarify this in my head, and I I would find stuff as well where I just oh wait, I completely forgot about that. Yeah, and and it wasn't that I think that my haunt life, I, that Mike and I were trying to document every moment because yeah. I don't think that was ever our intention. I think it was for me. I think it was just trying to get the emotional side conveyed. Of mm. again, it's like I think both of us felt that it was really an ambitious, important project that was having an effect on people. Yeah. And I think that's how we approached it rather than just a documentation of, and this happened and this happened. Yeah. It was like, no, this happened and it was really cool because of this. Yeah. And then it led to this and we freaked out over that and we mm -hmm. really got moved by this. And that was, I think what, I think that might be why people responded so strongly to us. Yeah. It wasn't, you guys weren't trying to document every moment in like a taking minutes term. You were trying to document a moment mm -hmm. in LA theater history and, you know, art, immersive art history as a whole and capture it because whatever comes next is going to be something different. And how different. it was affecting people. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really cool. Um, and you mentioned the way that you uh, edit, the, the fact that you have to edit the podcasts. Um, you do a pretty good job. Every time there's some like quirky little thing thrown in there where you guys are like, <laughs> you have some like echo effect or something. Oh, or, thank you. <laughs> or you just make Mike do it on his own because you, you don't feel like throwing the echo effect on yourself. Oh, and, and Mike has inspired a few of those definitely. <laughs> so speaking of, you know, documenting a moment, it feels like, and it, it might just be to me because I'm an outlier and I'm kind of entering this world, um, a new and uh, actually it kind of found me. And I think that probably happens to a lot of people in the immersive world because what happened to us is we just, we did a couple of immersive dance shows, which I think um, is a lot of people's way in to the uh, immersive world. And then where it's just like audience responsive dance, um, which can be very intimidating actually, because it's kind of like if a dancer comes up to you and they've been dancing their entire life and they walk up and they're, and actually what happened to me is that I was very off put by the immersive world. Cause I was like, Oh, they're going to put a fucking spotlight on me. I don't know how to dance. I was telling, um, talking about this on our previous podcast, we went to a immersive dance show at, um, I think it was night gallery down the street in the arts district. And this girl came up and started dancing and she just like walked up to my girlfriend and started doing this thing to her, like in her face. And it was the most immediate like critique 
my girl just looked at her, crossed her arms, turned around and walked away like so cold. And I was like, I could, <laughs> wow. I felt good for that artist. Like she just got immediate feedback on how she was performing, but she just honestly walked up to the wrong person. And I think that people get off put a lot by that. There was an article that we talked about. Um, someone wrote, you guys might know who I'm talking about, but um, in any case, Madeline can put it in the show notes here again, where she was saying she went to a theater show and they tried to do like an immersive, I put, I put this in air quotes as well, where they just like brought someone out and put them up on the stage and like kind of put them on the spot. Uh, oh, yeah. Megan's article. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's the one. And she was talking about how she was like, you're going to have to rip this fucking chair out with me. If I'm going to go like for 15 minutes, you're trying to pull her out of this damn chair. And she's like, I'm not going to do it. And then when I, when we first did the alone experience, which I'd love to talk to you guys about that and what you thought about it, because that was a very pivotal moment for me. It's where I met Scott Hove and we did our first immersive show. Cause that's when we did break bread. Mm-hmm. And, and it was our second alone experience as well was during break bread. Um, did you guys go to that one? The second one, the cake one? No, uh, no, missed that one. Uh, but um, it was when I first realized that you can, you know, make this art where the where the people have to go inside of it, and it's not a thing until there are people going inside of it. And I was like, this is new, and it might have been happening for a long time, but it feels like it's happening a lot right now in LA, and people are really starting to do some cool and original things with it. So when we talk about my haunt life and what you guys are doing, what you're documenting, and how you're capturing a moment, and how you attempt to capture a moment. Do you feel like you're on the cusp of something and that LA is like really filling up this tank with a ton of different experiences that people can, can have. And you're trying to capture that. Um, yes and no. I mean, it, like personally, like we're like Russell and I are not on the cusp of anything. Like we're just fans of, mm. of everything. And you, you know, the, one of the reasons my haunt life started is, you know, I grew up, in the punk and hardcore scene. So if you didn't like something, you would do try to do it yourself and do it better. Cool. And we kept seeing review sites, like give these reviews to shows that we've gone to. And it's like, did you go to the same show or did you go to the same haunt? Like, Oh, wait a minute. You're best friends with the creator. No wonder you gave that show a good review. (laughs) So me, you know, like in my, you know, 14 year old, like <laughs> punk rock, like fuck everyone mentality. It's like, we're going to start our own review site and we're going to give honest reviews and oh. we're going to do this. And, you know, and that's how everything started. Hmm. And because we saw criticisms of those same reviews, like people would, would write them. <laughs> Why are you laughing so hard, Russell? Yeah. <laughs> Continue. I'll get, I'll get there. Go ahead. <laughs> Continue. Great. <laughs> You just imagine you at 14 and angry. And no, no, no. I, 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 the reason I'm laughing is because I've, like, you're talking about a moment. Yeah. The day the 14 year old inner Mike called me <laughs> and said, This is what we're going to do. <laughs> Did that actually happen? Yes. Oh, so this, this is like an actual moment that took place that was like the, the inspiring moment that my haunt life came out of. Yeah, yeah. Mike's inner 14 year old called me. <laughs> And the creepy Russell was like, hey, why don't you come over? <laughs> oh. uh, that was a, no, that was a pedophile Mike joke. Has a, good yeah, one. Mike has a valid point in the fact that he, 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 uh, he, he we, were, we kept noticing, like, like, no one's being honest. Hmm. And it's not, it's not that we were trying to tear anything down. Right. Because, how, how do I say this? We're fans. Yeah. We want the shows to be good. And the thing that I, I told Mike at the time was, okay, I'm in as long as we keep it true to us and the fact that our excitement, our passion, because my haunt life was born basically out of a really, really passionate place. Yeah. And, you know, when, you know, the original concept was Mike's and he came out to me and said, 14 year old heart. Yes. 14 year old boy's heart. One of the most passionate places on planet Earth. Absolutely. <laughs> So, and I think that's where the flavor of my haunt life comes from, that we are optimistic. Mm. And, and even if we don't like something or have disagreements about something, the way things are done, we, we approach it from like, you know what? We want this to be good. It didn't work over here, but it worked here. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's I, I, I get response, you know, I think Mike does too, that, that people appreciate, that, yeah. that we try to be positive. And rarely have we ever said anything on, and we are honest, mm-hmm. but sometimes we're like, yeah, that didn't work so well. But I'm not going to tear somebody down because, as you said, you're being pulled into this world, mm-hmm. and I want people in this world. So I'm not going to badmouth somebody just because we have a podcast and, and, and we disagree with 
disagree with something that's being done, but I'm also not going to lie about it. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm not saying that other reviewers were lying when they gave positive reviews. No, they were. <laughs> All right. A couple of times they were. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Oh, one one show great. in particular, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, was that the one that inspired this moment? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, something I want to, uh, you brought up something very interesting about the immersive world, which I think is important, which is partially why I said what I just said. There is a difference between this, the immersive world as we're talking and that Mike and I are, are pretty passionate about. There's a difference between creating a world, creating a piece, creating a show that you want to pull people in and emotionally move them and involve them. And then you have the other thing, which is, all right, I need a volunteer from the audience and it's going to be you whether you yeah. like it or not. Yeah, That's a negative form of that. Mm -hmm. you know. And, and you go to... You know, it's like Mike and I both love magic. You know, it's like I've loved magic ever since I was a little kid. But there is this, the thing about the magician picking the, the participant from the audience. Mm -hmm. The smart magician can read the audience. And if there's someone who doesn't want to participate, the, uh, the magician won't force them. I think sometimes people have had that experience and they uh, unfortunately equate that with the immersive experience of being forced to do something that they feel will embarrass them or make them awkward. Like, look, it's okay if you want your audience to be awkward, but you can't make them feel self-conscious about it. Yeah. You can't say, I'm going to make you awkward in front of other people. You can't do that. that yeah, that's, so you're just ruining it for them. It's a very negative thing. You're turning them to the object instead of the subject. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a very good way of putting it. Yeah. And you, you want to pull them into the world. And if the world is awkward, great. They get to examine, why am I awkward? Mm -hmm. Why do I feel this way? That's constructive. That's positive. Mm -hmm. and, and trust me, I'm awkward a lot in my life. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <laughs> so, <laughs> just nodding in full agreement, very passionately right now. Mike has seen me be very awkward. <laughs> um, but that, but uh, but I think you raise an important point by going there, and the fact that you, it's you know this immersive world. It's easy to make enemies or foes if you don't treat the audience with a great deal of respect. Hmm. Yeah, and you guys, one of the things that I love that you do on your podcast is you will give very honest reviews. When you don't like something, you still find things to say about it that are like at least constructive criticism, you know? Like you'll say, well, this show did A, B, and C. Um, and then you'll say, well, what do you think about this part, Russell? And you'll say, well, this one didn't hit for me so so much because of blah, 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 blah. What do you mm -hmm. think about this part, Mike? Well, you know, I thought this, this, and this about this. And then you'll go over it as a whole and say, as a whole, the show accomplishes these things, doesn't hit so hard on these other ones. Um, did you... Did you set that up as a structure from the jump or did it just kind of naturally come out because of the fact that you two are so passionate about the scene? I think it came naturally. Hmm. And did you, what were you guys doing before? And you said it was a Craigslist ad. Yeah, you go, 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 going back to the first question <laughs> that we never answered. An hour all, ago, we didn't answer that That question. was a one, one hour tangent. But <laughs> when, when you guys were like already a part of this or just big fans of this scene, it sounds like, but not actually doing this show together, just were you, go, were you guys, guys just like going to shows together? Were you part of the same escape room crew? And then you were like, let's just make it so into a profession? We met. I mean, we're going on our five year anniversary oh, at this point. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Feels like oh wait, no. Uh, yeah, five. Four, yeah, four, five. Five, because it was a, the first Scare LA, and they're 20... they're doing their first. They're yeah. doing their fifth anniversary this year. Oh yeah. wow! So and they're doing something new this year. I got hit up by Laura, who's like a part of the whole mm -hmm. Scare LA team, and she was like, "Hey, come out for lunch this week because I want to talk to you. We're doing something new and special." And nice. I was like. Okay. And I, they're they're moving to the LA Convention Center. Yeah, they this said year too. but they said they're doing something downtown wide. That's the only words I have. Huh. Oh, interesting. Which sounds like a lot of like Raya LA was a comedy show. They did something that was downtown wide. Mm -hmm. they, they, right. A lot of people do that now, it seems. Um we talk about Night on Broadway. The multiple um, venue. Yeah. I mean if you have all these venues nearby and we're yeah. pretty close, whenever people are coming to do something at the convention center, like the LA Auto Show every year, E three every year, we get hit up and they, they're like, Hey, we want to throw a party in the middle of there's some like education conference and the only reason I know what's happening is because everyone keeps emailing me saying, We want this date in May. 
to throw a party during an education conference. And right. I'm like, oh, there must be an education conference at the convention center. <laughs> so um, it's probably something similar to that because we're technically walking distance and we're right by the Ace Hotel. But um, yeah, I wonder what they're going to do. They do some pretty cool shit at Scarlet. Yeah. Uh, and you guys met there at Scarlet? Yeah. So we, we, five years ago, it was a totally different landscape. Yeah. There were basically the big mainstream haunts and that's pretty much it. And then blackout came to town from New York. Um, and blackout is some call it an extreme haunt. Some call it an immersive haunt. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's both really. Um, they technically they're the first extreme haunt and we both went through not knowing each other. Um, but we both found this and at scare at the first scare LA, they had a blackout unofficial meetup. It was a random thing they put on their Facebook. Hey, like, hey, fans of blackout, meet in the lobby at 3 p.m. Hmm. And I went down there alone, no, knowing no one. And all of a sudden, there's this crew of people like Nick from Screenshot was there oh, and, cool. and, and Russell and like all these people that knew each other from doing blackout in the off season. But I had only done blackout once at that point. So I didn't know them. And I just kind of showed up and was like, Hey, and Russell was the huh. first person that was like, Hey, who are you? And, and cool. then that's how we met. And it took a few months for and Russell us. Russell was like, it sounds like you seem like you have a 14 year old boy inside. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get to know you. He was like, turn, Ru turn Russell's around. Russell's coming off very creepy. In this podcast. <laughs> this podcast? <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, but then, um, and the first time I met him, I thought he was the biggest prick ever, but <laughs> Um, which is a funny story and <laughs> tell it the yeah, longs. Okay. So, uh, Josh, the creator of blackout was there and he was like, you know, thank you for your support, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden he got super serious. He's like within 50 feet diameter of this spot, there are two clues. Whoever can find the clue and come back to me and repeat mm -hmm. it, you'll get a ticket to the next Halloween show. And so we all went, I went and, uh, uh welcome I back, Dino. <laughs> You're in the middle of a pedophilia story. <laughs> <laughs> so I found the guy that was hooded and ripped the tape off his mouth, which this goes with the pedophilia story, I guess. Um, and he told me the phrase and I got the phrase. I ran back to Josh and Josh was talking to someone. I'm polite. I waited for them to finish. I didn't want to interrupt. Russell comes in and is like, hey, Josh, it's blah, 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 blah. And I was like, <laughs> wait a minute. That's not how that went guy? down. <laughs> like, who are you? And I'm like, dude, like, come on. I'm, I'm standing here waiting. Get, like, get in line. And, <laughs> but karma came around. He totally messed it up. I said it correctly. <laughs> I and completely choked. I got the ticket. Oh. And then, but yeah, so that was our first meeting. And then, oh, wait, I, is that I how it actually went, Russell? Uh, my perspective was slightly different. <laughs> I did walk up. Mike was standing there. Josh was talking to someone else. And Josh turned around. And I think because I had met Josh before or something, mm. Josh kind of looked at both of us. And Josh came over to me first. Uh, and I completely screwed up the phrase, <laughs> choked. And I and I had that moment of like, what is it? I was, I was like, oh, but Josh asked me the question. I'm like, and I, I completely messed up the phrase. Uh, and then he turned to Mike and Mike got it correct. <laughs> So, and then you're, and there's I was not in intentionally a dick to Mike. <laughs> I was just accidentally a dick to Mike. <laughs> there you go. Unintentionally a dick. Yeah. The, the road to hell is paved with, uh, good intentions yes. or bad intentions. So, uh, and then later that day, we just, I think we just talked a little bit the yeah. rest of the afternoon. Yeah. Cause there was the, the extreme haunts panel mm -hmm. and I was sitting alone and you guys were all the blackout crew was in front. They're like, Hey, come sit with us. And I was like, okay guys. Yeah. I'm like, my new friends. <laughs> it also seems like this scene too is also something where it's kind of like people just become friends with each other because it's something where you, you like are into it, but you're not. And if someone's into it, you're like, oh yeah, we're in the, you know, we're in the same mm -hmm. scene. Yeah. It, Cause you really need that person to talk to, yeah. you yes. know, when blackout first came, you know, it was only in New York, LA hadn't seen anything like it. Yeah. And you try to talk about what happens inside to a normal person. And they look at you <laughs> like you're crazy, but then you talk to other people that have gone through and it's like, oh yeah, oh my God, that yeah. part and this part. Yeah. And they appreciate it. And, and, I, and I think that's that's what partially the community forms around that of like, okay, you, if I try to tell my family about this, they will not understand, you yep. know, why I like being pushed around in the dark or, you know, uh, that kind of thing. And it, it took a little while for Mike and I to, you know, I think we traded information. And then what I realized really quickly was that Mike was in touch, in tune with 
shows that I was unaware of probably. And he lived in a different area than I did. Mm. So it was like, I can learn from this guy. I, I realized that pretty early on. Cool. And so we just started sending emails back and forth. And you you said once to me, it was like, oh, I just, I kept, every time I would ask you about a show, you were already aware of it and had tickets or something. You said huh. that to me when, and I, I just realized that, wait, we're wanting to go to the same things. Cool. And then, you know, Mike a couple of times was like, hey, you want to meet here and talk? And yeah. And that's the friendship developed. Yeah. Cool. That's and awesome. Many times I've ruined his nights from, you know, because especially with movies, like I like the just most fucked up type <laughs> movies. And, you know, I'd be like, hey, have you seen this? And he's like, no, I've heard of it. And I show him. And then there's pictures of him on the internet like this, like <laughs> during scenes. Have you and, seen the new Flying Lotus movie? No. The one at Sundance it's supposed to be like the most grotesque, fucked up movie ever. Really? Flying yeah. Lotus, the artist? Yeah. The musician, yeah. Yeah. He has some like new fucked up movie that's just debuted at Sundance. It's supposed to be like so screwed up that people, so many people have like walked out wow. and been like holding back vomit. Oh, wow. Um, More so than a Serbian film? Oh, dude. <laughs> Do you there's, know what it's called? <laughs> there's some bad ones. Um, no, yeah, you should check it out. There's a Vice article actually that we should name drop where he talks about him trying to make it through the entire film. Which is uh, pretty cool. I have a friend who was in it named Shane Carpenter. He hired some weird actors too, which is hmm. kind of sweet. So um, yes, Mike has exposed me to numerous cinematic <laughs> wonders that I <laughs> that didn't even know existed. What's it called? Royal. Royal. Yeah. Okay. There you go. All right. So we'll keep an eye out for nice. it. Nice. So. so um, so yeah, so as you, you know, you talk about this, you say the landscape five years ago was so much different. Scary, right? Mm-hmm. There was, there was like these major haunts and they were definitely that. They were like haunts, right? Like there were some big haunts. There's the, um, the, what's the boat? Queen Mary? Mm-hmm. Is that what's yeah, called? Queen Mary. Beach, Universal. Which I still haven't gone and everyone says you have to go to it's that. It's fun. Point. Yeah. Have you been to that one, Dino? Yeah. Yeah. I need to go to that one. I really want to. Well, I, those are fun. Great makeup on their characters. Yeah. Yeah. One, the only claim to fame that I have in the haunt scene is that, uh, one year there were only two, um, haunts that got approved for alcohol in the LA area, the Queen Mary in here. <laughs> wow. I think that was uh, Matt Dorado's Drunken Devil, um, <laughs> his first one, where it was like a haunted house with an immersive bar in the back. Mm-hmm. Now he kind of just does the immersive bar part. But um, yeah, he actually attended that show. Yeah, and it was a fun one. And so, <clears throat> or the, the bar, especially in the back, was a cool thing for him to kind of discover because he's totally changed his brand into, into doing that now. Mm-hmm. We got to help him build it, which was a lot of fun. Um, but, you know, you say that there was this. Uh, scene that was very um you know the big haunt scene and then some people were maybe trying a couple of things you mentioned you ran to nick from screenshot productions and when i run into these people as well it just we just kind of become friends because i'm like well i kind of have this weird producer thing going on mainly Mm -hmm. because i have a venue right now but even when that stops happening i'm going to try to produce more um shows just because i can help make this shit happen with permitting and we all need each other to do that kind of stuff and so as people have started to find one another those lines have started to blur where it goes all the way to immersive art, immersive theater, like sight and audience responsive work to the haunt scene formal where you just like walk through and there's jump scares and you come out on the other end and you're at in line for popcorn at universal studios or whatever it is, you know? Mm -hmm. And now there's this whole area in between. Have you seen those things in these last five years as you've been watching the scene kind of come together? Um, not yet. Hmm. So, a little bit like shine on for example um anna one of the the creators of shine on collective she comes from the haunt scene and the horror scene so shine on shows uh sometime most of the time have a horror element um and that's from her but and the same thing with tension um you know creep uh is getting there they they combine good theatrical um things with haunt scenes and whatnot Mm -hmm. but as a whole it's still pretty separate even the traditional theater world and immersive theater is, is pretty separate. And mm-hmm. that's why this year at, at Fringe Fest, uh, they're, they're going to have an immersive theater category. And What's I Fringe th- Fest? Fringe Fest, it's in June. Um, it's in the theater district on is it Santa Monica Boulevard. Yeah, it's yeah. The, the theater district in Hollywood around Santa Monica Boulevard is the main core oh, cool. theater row. Yeah. And then they expand to venues nearby in that area. Um, hmm. uh, Hollywood Fringe Festival has been going on for several years. 
uh, it's last year they had over, I think, 250 shows during the month of June. Holy shit. Yeah, it's like June 9th through like the 20s oh, wow. at some point. And it's um, most of the shows are an hour or less, depending on what type of show it is. It covers a wide range of variety, everything from comedy to horror to immersive pieces to magic to musicals, oh, oh, musicals, one man shows, one woman shows, experimental pieces, um, cool. a little bit of everything. And it's a great festival to know about and it's been growing very very rapidly here in hollywood over the last few years and it's the tickets are extremely reasonable i think Mm. they range from like 12 to 20 dollars depending on the venue and depending on the show so if you check them out and usually they make an announcement of the schedule i think in mid-may probably Mm. and just check it out immediately and guarantee you if you search their website you will find a show that you want to go see cool yeah but I think if by adding the immersive theater category this year, more of the traditional theater people are going to be exposed to it and mm. have their eyes wide open. So I think there's going to be a good mix of those people coming together. But with the haunt stuff, I think it's still pretty separate for the most part. Yeah. We had, um, what's her name? Terry Hatcher, um, mm-hmm. Lois Lane from <laughs> oh, <laughs> Superman yeah. show. She came to one of our shows. I can't remember what it was. She found it during. Um, when we had that break bread show, that was just the cake one that was all over the place, hundreds of millions of hits online. So of course she'd find her way to that one. And she came to an immersive theater show. That's the thing she came to because mm-hmm. she, there were just tickets online and she just bought tickets to something. And then every time we labeled anything immersive theater, she would just buy a ticket to it. Didn't matter what it was. She's just like one of our fans. Now I text her. I'm like, Hey, there's another one coming up. And she just buys tickets to it. And she's just like a fan of the scene now. That's and great. That as an actress in a different realm coming from the film world, she's probably also interested in theater as a whole. Mm-hmm into immersive theater it, it's true like you just get exposed to it somehow and it enters people's lives in some way is that jess just yelling <laughs> um, <laughs> suddenly strange violent noises were in the background it's the, very disturbing <laughs> the immersive world is finding us right now. um and then you just you just enter the world somehow and you russell did you have am i mistaken or did you have a background in theater formal I actually, uh, I can honestly say that for a brief period of my life, I actually made my living as an actor. I was hired right out of college by a theater company. Uh, um, I uh, did that for the first season when I was out of school. What were you doing? uh, I was acting. And in what? Uh, we it was a rep company that did three rotating shows for an entire season. Cool. And uh, we did one classic. We did a Thornton Wilder thing. We did Medea. Um, which I, I it was very funny because at the time I was the nice guy. So huh. that's, oh, I still am the nice guy, I guess. <laughs> so typecasting. And so I was, uh, I took care of the kids in Medea and, you know, like cried and wailed and moaned when they got murdered. Oh, spoiler <laughs> in case you didn't know the t- plot of Medea. <laughs> <laughs> so if you aren't on board with that, you're a few thousand years late. Um, but, uh, yeah, it just like, uh, traditional. I think that company. one's past the. Spoiler alert, statute of limitations. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, and I can also say that I originated an original role in an original piece. There was a, a, somebody, uh, I don't know if you, do you know the Confederate investigator? No. No, Pardon me. um, The, the inspector general. Okay. Uh, Somebody did a version of where they took the inspector general and set it in the deep plantation South and called it the Confederate investigator. And so I, I was one of the main plantation owners. And so I actually can say that I originated a role in an original piece. Awesome. I was like, Hey, that's kind of a feather in my cap. (laughs) So wait, you owned a plantation. So So you you own slaves. So no, (laughs) his character did. He originated a character that did. But yeah, I I actually did that right out of college. And then I moved into trying to get into the film production world. And that's, uh, I worked on some sets that were um, shot in Mississippi, which is where I was living at the time. And I, that's how I got into the film industry and I'm an editor now. Oh, cool. So I usually edit uh, children's programs. Oh, awesome. So, and I've, I've worked with like Fox and blue sky out of Connecticut. And I've, I've worked with, uh, you know, right now I'm working with Disney. So Sweet. Um, working on creating children's program. Cool. Know. And then immersive just found you somehow through all that. Um, or like a haunt world. I, I think the connection for me was the haunt world. Huh. And, and and Mike, uh, if if Mike wants to tell the story, Mike was looking for something different. And I had reached a point where in my editing career, I gotten in kind of a rut, and mm. I was just like, I'm 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 literally working on the same kind of project over and over and over again. Huh. And I was looking for something to challenge me. I wanted a new form of storytelling. I just was hungry for something different, and I stumbled into the Blackout Show. 
Ah. And like that was just, okay, this is so nonlinear. This is so emotional and psychological. And yet I'm working to get the story out of it to create the narrative, to create the plot and, and to make it make sense because I was so used to the three act narrative that I was fighting. Like I, I have to figure this out. And I went back and then I went back again. And then I went cool. back a fourth time. Like just like, like this is affecting me and I have to figure mm-hmm. out why. And um, was, that was the first time I met Josh Randall was on their very last night in the very first show in Los Angeles. I literally walked up to one of the staff members and said, I have to meet the creator of this. Mm. And I will stay here and I will stand here for as long as it takes. Cool. Because I have to say something to him. Cool. And I met him then. I just said, I just need to say thank you. Hmm. I said, I get this. And he said, yeah, I know you've come back a couple of times. And I said, yeah, I have. I said, I, I just want to thank you because you have affected me and I get it. And he said, that's really nice because we've gotten a lot of negative feedback here in Los Angeles for our first time. Because there were a lot of people who didn't get it and thought, oh, you're exploiting sex, you're, which is not, in my opinion, what they were doing. So um, it's, um, the um, the end of that evening when I was able to just walk up and say, I just really appreciate what the hell you're doing. Yeah. You know, and for him to say, like, oh, thank you for saying that and acknowledging it. Yeah. And I think you guys definitely noticed that, too. Like when we did, I think we did a podcast with you guys um, before we did our Trap House experience and someone wrote you guys and was like, Hey, because of that podcast, you know, I found the, you know, haunt world and you sent that email to us and we were like, this is fucking awesome. It feels so good as a creator to hear that thing. And I, and I feel like, you know, musicians probably get that all the time. And then artists probably get that all the time. Probably galleries get that all the time. And and people just write them and say like, Oh, I had an experience. And you might feel like they're just kind of putting you on. But when it's an experience like this, where you're like completely taken over by it and just like shoved into this world, the response is so real that when you get that feedback as, as one of the creators or producers, directors, whatever it is, that feels really good. And I think that people in the haunt world love that shit. What mm-hmm. was your first way into the, into the haunt world? Uh, well, the haunt world in general, I was always a fan of like going to haunted houses when I was a little kid. And when I moved to California, going to Knott's and Universal and it just got really old really quick. And I stopped going because mm. I hated it, even though I loved it because mm. I hated going with 10,000 of my closest friends and, you know, conga lining through a haunt and seeing <laughs> the scare five feet in front of you. And I heard, I, I, I randomly one day I Googled like haunted houses that let you go through alone just to see if there was anything and blackout popped up wow. and randomly the same year they came to LA. So I found that. What I, year was that? Uh, 2012. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, and it, it just, I was like, Oh my God, like this, this you go through alone. And I, I started reading some of the things that happened in New York and it blew my mind. Like you can do that. They, yeah. Like what, <laughs> what is happening? Like, yeah. Oh my God. Like, and I got scared for the first time since I was a little kid. You know, like go, I'm like, I almost didn't go that first time because like, I don't, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, can I trust these people? Like I'm going through alone and they're like, I read about this and there's possibly this and what? And, yeah. and I went through and I felt fear Yeah, and that it, it was a game changer. Yeah. The first, the first moment for me, we talk about going through alone. I think it was the next year after that, after blackout came, um, the alone experience happened and, uh, they, did they do a show that year? They did, I think it was the year after. Yeah, I think it was the yeah, year 2000, after. 2013 was the first alone, and they did it in the, in like the Masonic building, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That, that's awesome. And I that, that one was that. awesome. Yeah, like, was, I love that very one. Cool. Yeah. What was that one? It was very blackout influenced. Oh, cool. Um, and so it, it's like if you went to that show and then go to what they're doing now, it's like night and day, hmm. you know, but they, they, per- darker themes, oh, yeah. Yeah. more horror. How does that work? Because is does the Masonic Temple just rent out their space, or are they very involved in what happens there? That I have no idea. Yeah, you have to ask. That. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> that that seems like it, like that's not a typical venue. Yeah, at least to my knowledge, unless it is. But like, yeah, I wonder how they got. But like right on. now, they're I mean, they've had escape rooms in that venue. Yeah. It's like they've had other theatrical events in that venue. Mm-hmm. So. It's like I they apparently make themselves available for certain types of events. What was that show? Interesting. Like what happened in it? Uh it was um well you 
walk through alone, of course. Um, and you know, it, it, I don't know if there was necessarily a story. Like I can't, I'm I, thinking I about it so and long. I'm piecing things. Yeah. Like I remember certain scenes, yeah, but I, I don't remember sequences from it. the mm-hmm. things, but there were things that they did that first year that blew me away mm-hmm. like that and scared me. Yeah. And you know, there was one point where you're walking down a hall and they, you have a, a really crappy flashlight and you come to a T and you look left. There's no one there. You look right. All of a sudden you see this guy running at you like oh, yeah. with a flashlight and it's just yeah. like, ah, and then, yeah. and then he grabs you. It was a lot more physical, yeah. uh, a lot more rougher yeah. um, and definitely a lot more darker, but it still had the typical alone, just weirdness, yeah. you know, where, you know, you're dancing with a woman on a bunch of vinyl records. And that was stuff. the, that was the crawling under the bed year too, wasn't yep. it? Yeah. yeah. And you and go into the room with all the dead bodies. Yeah. Somebody, somebody at one point, uh, like you ended up in a bed with someone for a brief moment hmm. and then they, they led you out of it. And then to get out of the room, they took a flashlight and they, and it's your flashlight and they, hmm. and they basically, you played fetch. What they did is they threw the flashlight under the bed and you had to crawl under the bed and it Whoa. led to a different that's, room. That's so cool. And they had a strobe light coffin. Oh, that's like, sick. Which totally <laughs> messed my eyes up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me, I don't know how, connected this is to you know escape rooms and immersive theater but like speakeasies there's a speakeasy in hollywood apparently where you are entertained by a woman in a bed <laughs> and then they lead you i think the bed opens and then they lead you yes to the actual speakeasy. I, I i and unfortunately i'm drawing a na- I, I, i'm Very drawing a blank in the name but i i know what you're referring to we'll yeah. put it in the show notes yeah, Madeline yeah. can find it. She'll probably love to go there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and, and it's, I think we all have that moment too, where you realize, for me, it wasn't even a experience that I personally had, but it was alone when I was like, wow, this is a new thing. Like you were saying, you would go to hunt. Do you have, do you guys have a time limit on when you got to get out of here, no. by the way? No, okay. go for it. Um, <clears throat> So uh, we'll probably wrap this up in like probably like 30 minutes because I might have a little bit of a time, <laughs> time limit, but I saw Russ looking at his watch. So no, that was just because it buzzed because I got a message. Oh, oh, you have one of those fancy watches? So <laughs> I see. Yeah, it talks to me. <laughs> <laughs> so you had this experience, Mike, where you're like, okay, I'm not scared about haunted houses. I'm walking behind a bunch of people in a conga line, and then five, you know, 20 feet in front of me, I see someone get scared, and then I'm gonna walk up there. Oh no, he's gonna scare me! Like, oh, look out! And then you were like, okay, let's see if I can just go through alone because that's going to solve the problem of me seeing someone in front of me right. get hit with the same problem. And then you get behind the scenes of something like alone and you watch everything that goes into it with the microphones and like the earpieces and the hold them, hey, hold them, hold them. You need to hold them in room, what like room 18 for another however much time because this person's trying to get, right. you know, going too fast through the area before. It's crazy how much goes into it. But when you walk through the experience, you're just having that experience. The, the moment that it really hit for me is we have a pretty cool freight elevator in the back. And so they brought a lot of shows want to bring people up that freight elevator in the back. Mm-hmm. There were two things that happened in that first alone experience for me that were really significant. Um, The way they pitched it to me was the reason that was my first um, exposure to the immersive world or like the immersive haunt world. And they showed me the the Masonic Lodge thing. And they were just they they were like, well, by the nature of our show, we can't really like show you anything. You can't document it because it's pitch black and we're not going to shoot everything in night vision because it looks stupid. Because the way we make it pitch black is like hang a bunch of duvetine from wire. So we can't really show you anything. (laughs) And so um, but when you're inside of it, it's incredible. So all I can do is try to explain to you and maybe show you a review. And, And I was like, this is intriguing. Whatever. Come over, you guys. And then they just like had all this charisma and just wooed me. Right. Um, and anyone who knows Larry and Devin are going to know that too. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was just like, you know, and I say this a lot there, if the think tank can't do a show like this, then there's nowhere to do a show like this. There's other venues that have the same kind of mindset as the think tank where we're just like, yeah, take our place over and use it in the most creative way you possibly can. But it takes venues like this to say yes for this scene to exist. So especially when we move out of this place, um, I just knocked on wood. If it does happen, um, then wherever we go next or other people who have venues who can do things like this, it's extremely important that they do. And I encourage anyone who might have access to any sort of building that you can get one of these things to take place in to just, you know, put it out there on the market, let artists know they can come inside of it and and manipulate it because it is uh, a really, really important thing. And it's um, 
some of the most incredible experiences that can be had. That said, when I finally saw it take place for the first time, because like a day before the show opened, I'm like, what the fuck is this going to be? They're working with <laughs> until the moment they turned the lights off, actually, at night. I was yeah. like, what the hell is this going to be? Like, I cannot tell if this is did these guys just blow smoke up my ass for like getting the venue half off because they wanted <laughs> they wanted to uh, be able to produce their show and they don't know what the fuck they're doing. And then the first time I saw people come through it, they brought you up the freight elevator they brought you into a room where you had to do a yoga experience. Oh, yeah. And you're like, this, this, that, the, the way they handled it right then. And I think what, what sets these guys' minds, you know, above and beyond a lot of the people that I've met is they think of the moments where you, you remember a couple moments from the first time you did an alone show. Mm -hmm. They think of these moments where they're like, okay, what's the mindset of people going to be as they're coming in? And they did a lot of stuff where they say, we want to, we want to be funny. We want to have some sensual moments. Like it's not just all scary because, we are using the fact that we know how our audience is kind of feeling as they walk in the door to our advantage to produce this show. So when you're doing this yoga show and they're making you put your hands up above your head and expose your rib cage and like all these sensitive areas, you're kind of like, I don't, a lot of people I was watching it on the cameras. A lot of people are like lifting their arms up like this, <laughs> like little chicken wings kind of thing because they didn't want to lift their arms up all the way because they don't know what the fuck's going to happen. And then there was a scene where <clears throat> there's five of you and you come in with five of your friends and you're like, okay, wait, I'm in here with five of my friends, but I'm supposed to go through this alone. What the fuck's going to happen to me? Like, I feel like the show's already started. And then the, so they already tricked you. And then the very first thing that happens is bam, an alarm goes off, the lights flash, and then four of the curtains behind four of the people open. And someone grabs you and bags you over your head and drags yeah. you into a room. And there's one person left. And they're like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> mm -hmm. And the cool thing is when my friends were going through, I could sit in the room and I could say, hey, Larry, my friend is this person. Make sure they're the last one left because they got, they were the most scared out of everybody because all their friends <laughs> just got snatched and they're like, what the fuck's going to happen to me? And then there was another moment. There was a cool moment in that show where they got, you got, um, pushed, you got to sit on a couch and the couch flipped over and you like fell inside, which was pretty awesome. Um, but there was another moment in that show where they had, you thought the show was over and they pushed you down through this like stairwell oh. in the back. Oh yeah. The hopeless guy. Yeah. So I would love to hear your guys' experience on that. Did you think the show was over or did you know that there was something else happening? I thought the show was over. Definitely. Can you describe that scene? So you, you leave through the, the back alley and you come out and there's uh, a homeless looking guy asking you for spare change. And like most people unfortunately and it's like no sorry man you know I'm, and you just had this crazy tense experience you're like i gotta get the fuck away yeah, from you i'm horrified exactly I'm downtown la <laughs> and so he keeps begging you and he gets more and more hostile with every every time he asks and it's like it gets to the point where he's like yelling at you and swearing at you and so you're walking away and it's like what oh, like dude just leave me alone like you know i'm sorry i don't have anything and then Did you know where you were going uh no <laughs> no it was just like i was just like out and i'm like um like walking. I was like, I think my car is over here. Or I parked near the entrance. But then when you walk by a door, there's someone, there was some, there was one or two people there and they're like, go upstairs. And it's like, yeah. Oh, Oh, it's not done. Okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah. And then you're only halfway done. Yeah. And that one was crazy too, because there's an apartment complex on, in the, on the other end of the alley. Mm -hmm. And so he would get really aggressive with some people and I would stand on the fire escape and watch him. It was my, one of my favorite things to do when I was working the event. I would stand on the fire escape and watch him because he, there were some people he grabbed him by the shirt coll collar and slammed him against the wall. And there were some people that he, they were like threatening to fight him. A couple of people like squared up, like about to throw a punch. And he would say a line from the experience they just had. So they would know a lot of people got really, really pissed. And I, we would have a problem and security would call and say, Hey, they want to talk to the directors. They're really upset that you did this to them. They think that it's not okay for you to like pretend you're attacking them in an alley in downtown LA with a homeless person. They didn't think it was like morally acceptable thing to do. They want their fucking money back. That happened a lot of times that actually during the show. Some other crazy shit that happened with our immersive mm. shows here with the, the dude, the Satanist. Oh yeah. There was a Satanist. Did you guys hear about that during the rope? No. Did you guys do the rope? No. That one was, <laughs> that was pretty nuts. I mean, to wrap up the story with, uh, with alone, you, from that point on, you go, you would go inside and then you had the second entire half of the mm -hmm. show after that, which was pretty amazing that they pulled it off to the point yeah. where someone. It's interesting. I actually had a different experience. I knew it wasn't over uh, because they had given me an instruction at the top of the stairs. They oh, told yeah? me to go find someone. Oh. And so when I, when the homeless person accosted me, I thought he was who I was supposed to find. Oh, so you just so I along. was engaging him <laughs> much more probably than some of the other people oh, were. 
So <laughs> I, I was like, but I thought he was part of the show because I had been told that I was going yeah. to encounter someone else. Mm -hmm. And then I got really frustrated because that show, that scene went on for so long. I actually, I did doubt it at one point. Ah. But, you know, that's as soon cool. as I turned the corner and I found the next person, I was like, oh, that's the person I'm supposed cool. to find. And that's actually, that, you just mentioned the person at the stairs before they send you out. That was a turning point for me in, in immersive experiences because, because, yeah, that was a because, great moment. because that woman, I believe it was Dolores, who's, mm -hmm. you know, does stuff with Nick now and yeah. stuff. And like, sh so if you're listening to this, you have a moment of my life, like ingrained in me. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, I but love Dolores this year at a lot of immersive shit. She like called me out by my name and my social media. And well, that was the first time because that was, you know, that was, you know, it seems like so long ago, but it was only a few years ago. No one was doing that. I was mm -hmm. like, Oh my God, you, you know, my name and you know, yep. my accounts like wh what? Yeah. And it was just like, Pfft. she had a, she had an earpiece in and that was actually one of the ways they sold it, sold it to us. They said that they were scouring people's social media to say things about them. And one of the coolest scenes in that, in that show was you would, walk into when you the first thing that happened you just think you got attacked by a homeless person you walk into a room and there's like a, mm -hmm. a girl sitting in a chair that looks kind of like the ring and you're like okay and she doesn't do anything you walk up to her, you're like what am i supposed to do and she just kind of like points her finger to the side and like you're like okay i guess i'll go that way you walk into the next room same exact girl sitting there they had identical I twins love that. oh yeah i love that sequence. identical room everything looks exactly the same and then she stands up and makes you sit in the chair and she kind of does some stuff to you for a second, depending on, you know, the, probably the flow of the audience mm -hmm. is how Devin's telling him what to do. And then the other girl comes in and you're like, okay, these are identical twins. That's, you know, a cool trick. The ones who they had the opportunity or people who had, let's say, the most malleable social media to cater to their experience got some really fucking nutso shit. Because like one of my friends, for example, lived in a, um, he lived in like a tent in Mexico for a long time or something like that and uh they would you know go crazy and run around circles and they would bend down and whisper something in your ear in both ears and she said something about the tent he lived in in mexico and i saw him on the video screen he just stood up and looked at him like bitch what the fuck did you just say <laughs> like, it, was, it was nuts and um my girlfriend uh she i mean she kind of knew what was going on but it was my first immersive show so she really didn't know she sat down and she said uh, i think i was gone that weekend on some trip or something um and you know my partner was running the venue and she went through and uh they bent bent down in her ears and said uh your boyfriend died on the plane to mexico or like to Ooh. phoenix or whatever it was oh that's and then like stood up and she was like what <laughs> like she actually she's like how would you even know who i am and like how could you have tracked me through this whole thing to even say that to me like she was freaked out for a second legitimately and then the very last thing that happened in that show i believe was they they brought you into like the scientist kind of room and um they would i think they like surveyed you or something some part of some experiment and they would actually have people's facebook images that they could put up on the screen oh yeah there was a projector in that yeah. yeah 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 which was pretty cool they, but they really went hard. Oh yeah. Well, even before that, you know, we, we talked about ARGs earlier alone did like a kind of ARG. And, you know, if you did all the steps and solved all the puzzles, there was, you got invited to someone's house Whoa. and it was, you know, there was, there was chalk drawings and it was like when the, the Enola foundation and you went in, they gave you tea and then you did this weird yoga ceremony in someone's Whoa. living room. And it was it was so cool. And then mm. at, when they did something at scare LA where you signed up and they would call you and it was exactly like the phone call Neo got in the matrix. It was like, <laughs> okay, go here, turn left, get in the elevator. No, nope, the right one. And you know, and it cool. was, and you got, went down to the basement and had an experience. Man, I want to watch the matrix <laughs> so bad right now. <laughs> matrix is such a good movie. I've always like wanted to be on my computer just like working like think about things and then my computer just goes black. Hello, Dino. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. oh my god. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that would be, that would be it's 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 a fantasy we all think of sometimes. Um, but yeah, during you guys did the rope. Did you guys do the rope that was here? No, uh, screenshot production show. Oh, yeah, the same is. Yeah, so there was this guy that they they do a lot of things, and they've had this happen to them before actually, because they do a lot of things with um their actors in robes, and they um it's a, it's a um, kind of a production trick in a way sometimes as well, because a lot of times you're on a shoestring budget. They're always the screenshot productions is always the one that someone's, everyone says, if they, if those motherfuckers get a budget, mm -hmm. they are going to make something crazy happen. So if anyone's listening that has a budget. Yeah. Nick's like a some, great guy. He's yeah, very creative. Yeah. Like some Neil Patrick Harris type character that gave, could give like Darren some money. You should pay attention to Nick from screenshot productions. <laughs> cause he's going to make something nuts. It's going to blow all of our minds. If, if he gets some money. 
Um, but they already do blow our minds even without it. And, um, he, he had one show that he did in some like, like private community type thing mm-hmm. where the cops came oh, and yeah. thought it was a cult. <laughs> and like, that's a crazy ass story. Uh, actually we know someone who was in the middle of that as it was happening. Julie, right? Julie? No. Oh, really? I, I, no, Another not person. her. Somebody else. Huh. Yeah. I actually wrote a piece on it for, um, um, for our blog a little while back. I'll share it. But, um, Nick told me the whole story. I interviewed him for like an hour about it. It was amazing. It's a crazy story. What happened? But what happened here? Same kind of thing. There's a bunch of people in robes. There was some guy outside. I think he was a skid row pimp. He was dressed like a skid row pimp and he acted like a fucking crazy person. He came from the skid row area, but he was wearing a really nice white suit, like all white. And saw some dude in a row bringing people in the back alley and was like, oh, there's some cult shit happening in there. This man was apparently a Satanist, crazy motherfucker, came inside and disrupted the show and was like screaming and yelling. He was like, you guys ain't real fucking Satanists. I'm a Satanist. You haven't worshipped the devil. Like He was nuts and like really ghetto Satanist. It was a weird combination. <laughs> <laughs> and so okay. he, yeah, he was like flipping out on them. He had to, they had to stop the show. They had to like they call the cops. Yeah, they had to call the cops. Wow. They, <laughs> I think they handled it mostly on their own. But then the guy stood outside and was following a bunch of the actresses to their car. So we had to have like the police escort them after that. He wouldn't leave. They kept like making him leave, and he kept coming back. That is another thing that a lot of haunts have to deal with. Yeah, crazy people. Have you had any? experiences with that like who was your friend that that happened to in uh in the other screenshot show uh i don't know if they want me to say their name i I know someone who was there that night and Mm. uh because they that was also the show where you got a soundtrack to listen to on your way to the show and so like everything was going well but they you know they said like yeah it's like my show got cut short because halfway through it suddenly like (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> and we were walking down the street and then suddenly we were told that the rest of the show wasn't going to happen. Yeah. And yeah, it, it was, uh, they were, they were disappointed because they thought the, the, like the intro was really, really good. Yeah. So, um, I, I've heard of a couple incidents. I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, but I, I don't know if this is related, but uh, Mike knows this. I, I've had a couple of weird personal people. <laughs> How do I put this? <laughs> <laughs> because because I'm in the documentary about blackout called the blackout experiments, ah. I have had a couple of weird encounters because of that. Really? Like, like crazy what? Fans? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and that's and it's like wait, what do you say? Like what? Like crazy fans. Oh. Yeah, and I I've um yeah, and it's like really nothing disturbing, but it but it has given me a little taste of I know that haunts have had to deal with super super. Overactive fans, hmm. you know. I I know that there's one haunt locally that, you know, there's one or two really passionate people who, like, <laughs> it, it you know it, it cross the, <laughs> the line. Cross the line. So there there, there is. Uh, oh, I I don't know if I can say this because it makes me nervous. Like there is because a listening. Yeah, well, that's, I don't know if they are no, but there there is a patron that has the reputation of sexually assaulting actors as they go through a haunt. Whoa. And the patron is gaining that reputation and the haunt community knows it. The haunts know it. It's Whoa. Russell. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not me. So, but yeah, but yeah, haunts have to deal with that, yeah. you know, and, and it's an unfortunate side to, I think people learning about the immersive scene and thinking that they have a certain rights or an entitlement that, oh, if you're an actor and you're performing for me, I get to do something to yeah. you. And like, no, you don't. Like some Westworld shit. Yeah, that's, that's a good point because we had the rope. There was a very, very, very physical part. Yeah, I, where, I know what you're talking yeah, about. Where they, mm-hmm. yeah. This guy slammed you onto the stage and I I was just enjoying it. Like I knew what it was, but it's, it's as interesting because I, I wonder how so, like, I could... It's funny because in the back of my mind, I was thinking, should I be more engaged? Should I fight back? And you could have. How many people literally like think I'm going to fight back no matter what? Like I'm engaging in this, which is awesome. At the same time, could be very, very dangerous. Well, that's and most immersive people know that you don't resist, you don't fight back, you go with the flow of the show. Yeah. And so, but 
in the haunt community, you do have those rules that are usually set up, especially since Mike and I have done some very extreme, intense shows yeah. over the past few years. It's for your safety. Yes, yeah, for your safety. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It have protects heard, the actor and it protects you. Have you heard stories of the reverse, like things that directors and producers have had to deal with where there's like unruly guests or things just going wrong in the middle of it that they've had to improvise the whole way through or... I, I I have I know of haunts that have had to eject patrons because they do get the the reflex mechanism yeah. going and uh, yeah it's like yeah people have to be ejected if if they if they show that resistance if they fight back it's like no you you should not be doing an immersive mm-hmm. piece and somebody you know said oh I could never do that because I if somebody touches me I immediately go to get your hands off me or I'm going to punch you and yeah. I said you shouldn't be doing immersive theater. And they're like, <laughs> no, I am the wrong person to do immersive huh. theater. They don't do immersive theater hmm. because they have that mechanism of somebody touches them and tries to move them. They're going to immediately yeah. fall back and, you know, put the fists up. Yeah. Maybe like, someone can make a show where all the actors are fighters. <laughs> Jiu-jitsu, <laughs> Jiu-jitsu black belts. Well, but, UFC yeah. presents. Yeah. Exactly. Haunted house. So, <laughs> that would be but no, but it's, it's like, yeah, it's like we, I know of haunts have had to eject patrons and I know of haunts that have had to deal with hmm. the overactive fans. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, and you know, I luckily, you know, my personal experience through the documentary and doing so many Q and A's about it. Yeah. It's like, People have approached me oddly a couple of times, so I've not had to deal with any of that. Yeah. On, so. the, on the producer side of things, like we can bring up Alone again, for example. There was So their safe word is together, the opposite of alone, right? Right. Um, mm-hmm. Which also plays into their narrative. But our friend Seth Armstrong, who had a studio here, Incredible Painter, and his girlfriend Madeline went through the show. And Madeline was like, not about it. I'm not about this. I'm not about it. I don't, I don't want to do this. She was almost doing it just because we got a couple free tickets in exchange for, you know, helping those guys out to produce the show and she got one of them. So she was just kind of like, if it wasn't free, I wouldn't do it. If my boyfriend didn't want to, I wouldn't do it. I don't know if I want to do this. And as a lot of us, it was our first exposure to, you know, immersive haunts. So she forgot the safe word was together. And there is a scene, there was a scene there where you like sit down in a chair and you watch on a small little TV with like three mannequins and the lights are going on and off. And one of the mannequins moves and the lights go on and off. And then he walks up to the person in the chair and slaps their head. Off, I basically. loved that right. sequence. Right. And yeah. so that person was Devin and Larry fucking loved it. Cause he was like, we had to shoot it like three times. Just slap the hell out of Devin. <laughs> <Right in> his, <laughs> face, his crazy hair bouncing all over the place. So, and then they push you into a room and you're in the room that you just saw on the TV. And there's three mannequins in front of you and the lights are going off. You're like, fuck. And, the, and he comes walking up to you and he pulls his hand back. Like mm-hmm. the lights go, the strobe goes on and off again. And he's going to hit you. And then surprise, he tickles you. And it's just like a funny scene, right? She didn't make it that far to the, like the tickle part. And she stood up and she's like, no, fuck this, fuck this, no. And they were, I was watching this on the screen and they're like, hey, someone's got to stop her. Like you have to let her know. And the actor's trying to walk up to her and tell her like, no, it's okay. It's okay. And she forgot the word, the safe word was together. So she just started screaming, safe word, safe word. <laughs> and turned around and started sprinting, but it's pitch black because that's how they do it. And so she uh, tore down half the set as she was going, which was a pretty hilarious. They had to deal with it at that point. Yeah. They're like, there's people halfway through the show and they're pushing people through like one every three minutes or something like that, or mm-hmm. like one every minute. So they absolutely had to deal with that, which is, which is a pretty funny thing. That's one thing I'd like to ask you guys too is, you know, People, like you were saying, a lot of people go to, you know, not scary farms. And that's mm-hmm. their that's what they know about the haunt world, right? They go to the Queen Mary. That's what they know about it. But as things start to happen, like this fringe fest where the theater world is going to start to catch on to the immersive world, like it's going to start to spread. And that line is going to become more and more blurred. And the things people are doing already are much more original and creative. And they're in- involving social, like you said. And they're they're already starting to do really out there things that people are not going to know how to respond to. And they're doing that on purpose to try to give someone an experience that they um, wouldn't have otherwise had. Mm -hmm. At the same time, what's going to happen is as we're making these more and more original experiences, you might call them insular where you're playing to the audience that knows this shit and trying to make something original and brand new for them to experience. At the same time, people are going to be finding that and it's happened through your podcast that have never done it before a mainstream audience and doesn't know the rules. They don't know that you can't have a fight response in a fight or flight. Have you, how do you think that the industry is going to have to deal with that scenario? How, how can you, how can a producer or director deal with that to be both fresh and taking in new audiences that don't know what the fuck they're doing yet? 
That's a, it's a good question. And I think even though it will grow and it will get bigger, it's still going to be a subculture of a subculture. So even though you may get more fans, it's not, you're not going to have in my, at least in my opinion, you're not going to have, you know, you're not going to have an, the same people that go to universal once a year, go through immersive experiences because they're just, it's not on their radar. Mm. You know, their everyday life, the things that they're into, um, it, it, they don't cross. It's, they don't like horror. They don't really like haunted houses. They go to a haunted house around Halloween. Cause that's what you do. Yeah. You know, so unless you're exploring, you're not going to find those things. I think a lot of it is going to be word of mouth and, you know, with, with people like Noah, like shining it and, you know, and, and with what you guys are doing and what you guys are doing here on top of the podcast and what you're allowing people to do and create and let people get their vision. It's going to be a big word of mouth thing more than anything. And I think when word of mouth happens, those caveats happen as well. It's like, oh, this is so cool, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can do this. Um, and it's like whatever you say comes into the story. And at some point, you know, if I found something, if I thought Russell was into it, I'm going to tell him because I know he would he would get it and he would understand it. And I think the same goes for most people. Like, mm. oh my God, I found this thing and you, you're you a part of the story. It's so cool. You would love it. I don't necessarily know if when that happens, people are going to be like, oh, but by the way, don't punch someone. You know, I think, <laughs> I think for the, mo for like, for a lot of that, it's going to be common sense. Like you, you, you know, people are going to know what to say to their friends. Huh. Um, and then also I think some of that responsibility should be put on the people creating as well. Yes, definitely. Um, you know, when we, we just did an escape room today and, and so it's fresh in my mind, you know, the opening spiel, if it doesn't move with two fingers, it's probably not going to move. Anything that should be moved can be moved easily. Don't rip things off the floor. Don't rip things off the wall. Yeah, in our escape room, someone ripped the uh, lock handle off oh. instead of solving the lock. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, when when things like that happen, I think the, the creator is like, even if it's for an immersive show those kind of warnings should happen, whether it be in the yes. emails or, you know, when people are signing a waiver, like, okay, if you don't punch people, don't do this, you know, like don't touch the actors, they, but they can touch you, you know, stand, if, if immersive theater takes from the haunt world, I think it'll be more acceptable and people will get it a lot mm -hmm. better. Yeah. That, my thought was that it's, it's partially the community's responsibility to approach this intelligently. And, and, you know, the, the bad version of it not happening is the person who enters an escape room and tears something off a wall. Yeah. Like, why would you ever think that is okay? Yeah. But I, I do think it's upon the event to partially educate the audience that is walking in their doors because every event is slightly different. So you have to take the responsibility of like, okay, this, these are the rules. Yeah. But I also expect the audience to step up and follow those rules and respect those rules. Because as Mike said earlier, it's for your protection, the patron, yeah. as well as the protection of the performer who's in the scene with you. So it's, it's a mutual educational agreement in the fact that, hey, everybody has to realize what they're doing and how they're exploring and know that it has to be done safely and with respect. So we're really going to turn the industry on its head and we're going to need to have a great opening spiel when we do our jujitsu escape room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People are going to have a really hard time. You must Every break this many bricks to <laughs> escape. Yeah, <that's> right. <laughs> yeah, the actor, actress has got to be a master. Actually, yeah. yes. That's a good point you guys bring up because I feel like even if, like honestly, even if someone was to punch through a wall, it's really going to come down to how intelligent and how well your actor actress is able to think on their feet. Because honestly, I don't think you could ever plan for every situation. No, you can't. Happen. No, you and, can't. And that's the, that's why it comes down to that person in the room. You really got to trust them. They can't just be, or they could be, but they, it would be better if they were just some like, you know, hired gone at last minute like for example during trap house we had a uh, main actress and we really really trusted her because she did such a good job mm -hmm. of managing 
the the particular crowd that was in there at that moment. Whatever, if they were quiet, if they were loud, if they weren't getting it, or if they were really intelligent, it didn't matter. Like she was able to handle that. So I think it's a good point. Is like having that person that's not just someone sitting there because like we had an experience where we went to a, a, a escape room and they were basically just telling us what to do, versus our actress who was actually part of a narrative and made you feel like you're part of that story and also very intelligent and on her feet and able to react to whatever was happening. Yeah. So that, uh, I love that point. Yeah. And, and actually on our very most recent podcast, actually, we did have a conversation because we were talking escape rooms uh, about how eventually in any situation, someone is going to discover something, do something, solve a puzzle react to a scare so like in a way that you never ever in a million years or ever saw coming yeah you know and it and is the person who you know will run through a set yep you know and literally run through a wall because they got so freaked out and it requires great improv actors Uh, Mm -hmm. yeah exactly that's why that that workshop sold out how to be an immersive performer um that's happening at at uh basic flowers and whatever week and as a symptom of this podcast and the shouting it out so much will happen hopefully another week after that and we'll get 10% of a finder's fee on all of the um, ticket sales. Um, add a second uh, date. <laughs> um, so one last question that I have, unless there's anything else you guys want to talk about. Um, you mentioned it kind of bringing it all back full circle to the, to the way that um, you uh, found your way into the ARG scene. Similarly, probably to how you, how you found your way into hosting this like, haunt an immersive theater review, um, you know, doing this podcast that you're doing. Um, you mentioned that there were things that in the haunt world and, and you said, Mike, that, uh, the haunt scene in general started to bore you. Um, there were things that, like new trends, things in the haunt world that were, um, haunts that were, you know, popping up that were similar to each other, things that were happening that were similar to each other that were frustrating you. And it sounds like the, the scene might be kind of like, speaking to itself in a weird way where these trends start to happen and some are working and some are not and some some are successful and some are not what advice would you give to people who are already making shows or someone who wants to step into this world brand new and make new shows um based on things that you see happen a lot in the haunt scenes and and what are those things what are things that you see happen a lot in the haunt scenes? i mean my advice first of all is if you have an idea create like because it's not going to do anything just running around in your brain and then don't be scared. Uh, you know, we, we had, we were lucky enough to interview Josh from blackout. And one of the questions I asked him was what would 2012 Josh or, you know, 2009 Josh, whenever you created blackout, tell this Josh, or what would this Josh tell that Josh? And it was not to be scared, you know, like, the first time they got someone naked, it was like, can we do this? Is this okay? (laughs) And it was like, they did it and people loved it. So it's like, don't be afraid to take chances and, and, and do things that are going to push the boundaries. Mm. You know, I mean, nudity at the time was huge, Yeah, you know, Brand and, new. and now it's, Oh, every, Oh, I have to get naked. Okay. You know, <laughs> like a lot of ha- haunts and extreme haunts and theater do that now. Yeah. And, you know, so some do, yeah, <laughs> but also like my attitude toward that is, um, you have to, you have to be an entity that people look to and go like, Oh, I will put my faith and trust in you because of the the way you behave, your professionalism. Hmm. It's like, no, you have to, if you want me to go through a show naked, like that is a huge ask. Yeah. And you had better respect me for being willing to possibly give you that opportunity. You know, and then look, I, I've gone, I've had an issue with the, with a show that asked me to do that, that didn't earn that respect. Mm. So the level of professionalism wasn't there enough for you to. Yes, exactly. And, and that's, that's what I would add to what Mike just said is, you know, create, you know, take risks, invite it. I said it earlier of like, this is an immersive world that you want to invite people in. Don't be afraid to invite people in to what you want to create, but respect them for taking the risk of following you. Yeah. And I think Mike and I have talked about this, uh, privately that I think in the future customer service and respect of the patron is going to be paramount Hmm. because when you have shows like tension, 
the tension experience paid attention to their patrons. And there were times when they fumbled the ball, but they always made an effort to try to recover the fumble. Hmm. Like, ooh, we blew that. Okay, let's let's see if we can make it right. There are other shows that take the attitude of like, no, it's like, you know, we we have this attitude, we're superior. We're like, there's a, there's a level of like, you're just the patron. Like, no, I don't think that's going to last very long. Yeah, I, I think I think some shows have gotten by with bad customer service because of things like tension, because of things like Speakeasy Society, who are so good to their patrons mm-hmm. and so interested in what their patrons are getting out of their shows. Those companies who are, I'm going to say, partnering with their own patrons hmm. to get the most out of the experience. I think those shows will see bigger success than the shows that go like, oh, we just want to put on a show. And if you come and like it, great. It's like, no, you're going to have to be, you're going to have to respond a little bit better to the patron than that. And, and I, and it's coming from the response of Mike and I have talked about, you know, some bad customer service experiences mm-hmm. we've had. Yeah. That's a, that's a crazy point to bring up because you think all directors, myself included, think of, Okay, what's the attention to detail? What are those like pivotal moments? What are the things that my, you know, the people who are really paying attention are going to notice? And you think of those like when we did our show with Pornhub, we had <laughs> um, uh, people recording. Um, uh, it was a kink confessional. They had recorded little statements into a phone, and then it played in the bathroom. What people were saying was playing into the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Their, their confessionals on their fu- on the future of kink. And um, we were like, yeah, that's some like really nice attention to detail. When I think of attention to detail, I think of that. Like people, someone's going to be in the bathroom, hear that, remember that they just recorded something on that phone and then realize they're going to have that moment. And that's the attention to detail for me. That's that immersive part. Mm -hmm. But when you break it down to something as simple as customer service, where all of us know customer service, all of us know good customer service and bad customer service. And you're thinking of when you're calling a helpline, when your direct TV goes out, or when you are waiting for someone to refill your water after you've asked three times at a restaurant, that's what you're kind of thinking of as customer service. You don't apply it so much as a director directly to, it might be actually overlooked. And I can say doing our first immersive show that we produced ourselves and directed ourselves for the trap house experience, that was some of the customer service problems that we had were some of the things that we, I guess, we just overlooked in a weird way, which were some of the most difficult things to overcome because we were like, that was like some of our biggest failures, I would say. And that's a, that's a, yeah, I think it's just an overlooked thing that a lot of producers might uh, need to pay a lot of attention to as they try to produce good shows. Well, I think what you, you just touched on the key point. It's part of the entire experience. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not separate. It's yeah. part of the experience. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the shows that send you an email in advance and say that, like, this is what our event is. This is how we expect you to behave. This is what we are going to deliver. This is like those. And I'm not saying reveal. I'm not saying give spoilers, but it's like prepare your audience and they will come and they should, in most cases, I think, respect you. It, like that's part of the experience. So the follow up email, if you if you promise me an email don't not send an email. Yeah. And going hand in hand with that, if it's your first show and we know how super excited people can be, make sure you have a website up. When you tell people to go to the website, make sure you have a Facebook <laughs> up and Twitter and, yeah, and Instagram. <laughs> you know, if, if you say like all the information can be found on a website, make sure there's a website there. <laughs> just, just wait a week to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> I sure did that recently of like sent out emails and announced and, there was no website, even oh, though they had announced a website. Oh, man. Well, you just lost a whole bunch of ticket sales. <laughs> yeah. That's what happened there. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, you know, how can the haunt scene improve? But it sounds like that fucking nails it right there. That's a really good takeaway. It's just good customer service. It's You can always improve your customer service. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Always. And I'm not saying the customer is always right. Yeah. I'm just saying respect and deal When they rip the lock off customer. the wall, they're fucking wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. So I just respect, but respect and deal with your customer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And so, so I, I, to, to me, an interesting point of that is the line you have to find between breaking the world that you've brought them into and addressing them as a customer yeah. and no longer as someone in their immersive experience. There's, I feel like that's going to be a very interesting line to like walk down. It, it is an interesting line. However, just as a, as a patron who, look, I go to a lot of different types of experience. I'm a theater nerd. 
So, and, and I do this to Mike all the time. I, I, I will come to Mike and like, I don't know if you'd be interested in this. And Mike will look at me and go like, are you nuts? That is so not me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I go to a lot of different shows, mm -hmm. but you know, the, the communication of, I would much rather have an answer to my question mm -hmm. than have someone going like, Ooh, I don't want to break the mystery. Yeah. Like, that's no, a, I need to walk. know. Okay. So I need to know what kind. How do I dress? What shoes do oh, I wear? I mean, I mean more during the actual experience. Oh, during. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about in preparation for the experience. What you're talking about is very important as well. Like the more more preparation, the better, because then you can actually experience it to the fullest degree. Absolutely. But, but during the actual experience, how do you give someone customer service? If, like, say, for example, someone has no idea, they, they didn't know, they didn't realize it should be this way. Yeah, like, that's a tough one. Not break character, but also help them. And I feel like that's going to be an issue, like, down the line. That probably well, is an issue right now. But like, you've already you've already brought it up in this conversation, and you've already dealt with it in the fact mm -hmm. that you have a, an actress in your last event yeah. that was very good at improv, that was able to help yeah. steer. Yeah. And th I think that's the key during the experience. If you went, if you end up someone like completely unprepared. You have to be gentle with them, and you know, are, and if they're overzealous, you have to go like, "Oh, that's great! Your energy's great, but yeah. hey, why don't we focus on this?" Yeah. 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 <laughs> you have you have to have a performer that can steer it. Yeah, true. so they're, they're like the celebrities of the future. So you know, <laughs> it's it's <laughs> yeah, as long as the world is consistent and the actor or actress can help steer the focus of the sequence. Yeah, yeah, it, and yes, you have to adjust it per patron sometimes or per group of patrons. Yeah. You know, because, you know, most immersive pieces are either one on one or they're very small groups. Mm -hmm. You know, like speakeasy shows, you, you can sometimes end up in a group of four to six. So, and that's yep. a slightly different dynamic. But they handle it very always well. different size, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a tightrope to walk for sure. Um, so, what happens to you guys when it's not haunt season or it's like a slow season like this? Um, and what are you guys up to right now? And what are you looking forward to? I mean, we're still busy. Yeah. You yeah. know, like there's so much that LA has to offer that it, there's always something going on. I mean, we were joking the other day, like the first weekend in March, it's like October again because mm. there's so many shows go happening like mm. that just got announced. Yeah, and there's multiple haunts mm. and multiple theater things happening that first weekend in October in in March. Mm -hmm. So if someone's gonna try their first one right now, what do you suggest? Uh, if they can get a ticket, probably Speakeasy Society. Yeah, if they can get a ticket, uh, what are they doing right now? Uh, right now, they just finished the chapter one of the Kansas collection, which is called the Key. Next weekend, they're doing chapter two, which is called the Axe. Um, they've done chapter one. I think this is the third time, so chances are they'll probably be doing the Axe a couple more times as well. Cool. Um, that is just like it's not horror, so you don't have to worry about being scared. And what the key was was basically just a one-on-one -on -one interaction uh, with the with the character, and cool. that sets up for the rest of the shows. Cool. And that's something that like I think it's a good um, toe in the water type of experience for people that are interested um, because they do it so well. And Shine on Collective has a show coming mm -hmm. up too, and I think that's a good company to experiment with. <laughs> What Even, do they got coming up? Uh, um, to the Wild? Yes. It has to do with Irish legends? Yeah, Irish maybe. folklore is, Ooh, is cool. what they've li listed as part of the description, but uh, no one knows exactly for sure what it is. Uh, they take It takes place, one of them I know takes place in a pub. Mm -hmm. So awesome. it, it's some sort of an immersive piece probably. Um, it's just their last show, even though it had dark and some horror elements to it, it was more of a drama Mm. That unfolded through various forms, like everything from pantomime to interpretive dance to dramatic scenes to immersive sequences. Um, yeah, it's just a shine on collective. What was their last one? Uh, Devoted was their okay. last show. Sweet. Um, so shine on collective is another good company to kind of look at and, and, and see if you can get a ticket to one of their shows. Cool. And what are you guys looking forward to with uh scare LA coming up this summer? Um, Who man. are you looking forward to seeing? Uh, everyone that's there i mean it's such a it's such a cop-out answer but i mean there's so much stuff there and, mm -hmm. and i mean it, it's a little early to say because we don't know who's going to be there but if basing it on last year you know they have like a haunted house zone and you know last year they had todd robbins and that was one of the highlights that so was if, a highlight of the if, year if they mm -hmm. go out of the box and do more things like that it oh it's gonna be incredible 
And the fact that there's two conventions, Scarlet and Midsummer Scream, both happening so close to each other. Yeah. Uh, it'll be interesting this year to see how the two convention personalities. I, I think mm. there's. I think both conventions are still defining themselves. Cool. All right, sweet. And how can people find you guys? Uh, you can find us on the web at myhauntlife.com. Uh, and if you go to the website, we have a calendar of events. Um, so usually it started off as a haunt calendar, but now it's kind of a, an immersive slash haunt calendar. Uh, so all the things that we had mentioned are up there um, when they're happening, links to tickets, uh, information about it, et cetera. And there's also an escape room map uh, of most, because I need to update it, of the escape rooms in L.A., uh, and also there's a visit LA section on there. So if you're visiting LA and you are into creepy things like we are and hate mm. touristy things, um, <laughs> there's that. So it has lists of like, you know, taxidermy shops and haunted places. Wow. That's incredible. Stuff like that. I didn't know this was on there. Yeah. yeah. Pretty, uh, yeah it's <laughs> um, represent LA. No, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so my uh, and then on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Periscope, my haunt life. Cool. Make it easy for you. Cool. Oh, and we have a, a haunt line, so you can call <laughs> and leave us a message. Uh, <laughs> who came up with that? Who do, who do you think? <laughs> Look at this smile. <laughs> um, and that's uh, 515 Haunt LA. Awesome. Any other closing statements? Uh, thank you so much for, yeah, thanks for, for having for us. for this chat. I mean, this is like, we, we, literally, it's funny because Mike and I were outside going, we're not exactly sure what we're going to talk about because <laughs> uh, it's the beginning of the year and all that. Yeah. But yeah, it's like we've touched on some of the highlights of last year and what we're looking forward to this year. And yeah. um, it's funny, we did an escape room earlier today and I feel like it's time to catch up on escape rooms yeah, because the absolutely. haunt season got so busy. Yep. You know, now it's time to concentrate on that. And there's, you know, like immersive theater pieces. And it's going to be tough because I got PSVR. So I've just been playing resident Ooh. evil seven every day. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I don't want to leave my house. Did you see the guy do the speed run with the knife. Only? Yes. On that house. <laughs> oh, ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, on that house too, which is the crazy. I haven't even over. attempted Madhouse yet. I adamantly stay away from video games because of my, horrible addiction to them growing up and, and, <laughs> really? and into like through high school and into college i was like okay i have to cut this off at some point so i have not played it and i will not please don't invite me uh mike is, <laughs> mike has turned this into a gateway drug i think for me <laughs> yep, because so i am not a gamer and you know because of the vr stuff you know mike very very cleverly yeah like, oh, well, you're not a gamer, so here, you know, to hold the controller, like, do this. And, the, and then he put me in Batman Arkham, and holy crap, my whole <laughs> mind just blew, like, I exploded. And like, like, this is so amazing. Yeah. It's so beautiful, and it's so creepy. And I was screaming at the jump scares, yeah. and I, I was like, okay. It, yeah, it's another form of immersive entertainment. Yeah, as, yeah, it, as, it, as VR... VR is going to enter the immersive theater world mm -hmm. way harder than it enters the formal film world. Yeah. And it's going to be a, a really awesome crossover. And I've, people have already started doing it with escape rooms. People have already started doing it with some immersive theater shows. And that's going to be something really mm -hmm. exciting to look forward to as well, which well, I'm sure you guys will cover on your podcast. And it's funny because there's a game called I Expect You to Die, which is basically <laughs> a one person escape room. Oh, wow. And watching Russell play that, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, 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 we laugh because, you know, hindsight, it's, it's hilarious, but, like him getting so frustrated actually helped me see huh. how his brain works. Huh. So today we did that escape room where if there was we, a great moment and there was a moment he was stuck and I was like, are you in your box? Mm -hmm. Because I realized that once he gets himself in that box, cool. he doesn't look That's outside cool. of it. And yeah. it helped. They can change the name of the game. Or the sequel can be, I expect Russell to die. Off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a good point too on escape rooms is that you will truly learn like Run through one of those things with your girlfriend, and uh, you know you might be sleeping on it the couch. It teaches you a lot about your friends. Yeah, absolutely. So, oh, and by the way, may I say that we had not been given a clue at that point that uh. we were supposed to have received. So <laughs> that was one on. of the reasons I was stuck in my box is I was I was not given a key piece of information. But yeah. even without that information, I went in and found it right away. Which is true. Just saying. Which is true. <laughs> He's so far outside the box. He's on a totally different level. Well, thank box you. Box adjacent. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. I appreciate appreciate you guys coming on. I hope everyone will uh, check you out. Uh, thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye, all. Well, I will be damned. That was a hell of a good conversation, which we kind of weren't expecting because those dudes just kind of showed up outside the door and they were like, hey, we don't know what we can talk about. It's kind of a slow season right now. We're just 
experiencing all the escape rooms that we never had a chance to go to. Um, like they said, one of the best things that you can do if you want to, there's, there's no way to know what this is unless you experience it. And that's one of the benefits of this world. And it's one of the few things that are left that you can't capture and put on Instagram anymore, that people are making brand new shit. Um, people are making things intentionally that have no way to capture and put on your social media. So the only way to know what this is, is to actually go, which is awesome. And there's some stuff that's really expensive and there's some stuff that's really, really inexpensive. And there's some stuff that's actually free. So I didn't even know when I brought these guys into the studio that they had this section of their website that showed all of the escape rooms and all of the different immersive theater shows that are happening. My suggestion is if you're into this, do two things. One, go to their website. Two, uh, and listen to their podcast. Two, subscribe to the No Proscenium. That's P-O-R-S-C-E-N-I-U-M. Um, newsletter for the part of the country that you live in. Hopefully you're in one that they cover and uh, find out what's happening. Cause in LA, like they said, there's a bunch of shows opening in March and um, uh, no proscenium starting to cover uh, VR. Now um, they don't go so deep into the haunted house realm um, or really even into the escape room realm as much, but the My Haunt Life guys do. So those two things in tandem, and you know they're good friends with one another, and they, sh they share a lot of the same guests and things like that. So following No Persinium, following My Haunt Life, that's pretty much my one-two hit combo to know what's happening in the immersive theater scene and the immersive entertainment scene, and uh, to go to all the funnest escape rooms. Um, and just grab a friend and go. Um, so aside from that, thank you everybody who's still listening. Um, if you haven't done it yet, please give us a five-star review on iTunes. It really helps us out a lot. It helps us share this podcast, put some kind of like fun words, make fun of how much I stutter on the microphone or whatever you want to do and um, share it. It's uh, it's relatively easy to share depending on if you're on Stitcher or I iTunes podcast app or whatever. Just hit the share button and send it to someone that you think would like it. Um, every week, a new person hits me up that just started listening and listened to one or two different episodes. And uh, I really love when things that I'm gathering from our guests are being gathered by more people than me. And that's why we sit in this podcast studio and hit the record button and talk our faces off. So um, thanks, y'all. <laughs>